قال بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم because that would take three hours by itself. So we're not going to do that today. But at least we're starting with Alhamdulillah, the first part of the Fatiha. Now when we translate Alhamdulillah, when we translate it into English, what do we say? Anybody know? You can call it out. It's okay. Praise be to Allah. Anybody else heard any other translation of Alhamdulillah? All praises for Allah, all praises to Allah, etc. etc. What I want to start with is actually the difference in between two things. And I want you to understand both of these things. Actually, the word hamd means two things at the same time. It means two things at the same time. It means praise and it means thanks. I'll have to make you repeat this after me. What are the two things that Fatiha means or Alhamd means? Alhamd. Praise and thanks. Praise and thanks. And by the end of this lesson, I will explain the difference between both of those things. Because they are very different. Those are two very different things and they're combined inside the word Alhamd. But for now, I have to teach you certain lessons and in order to make sure you understand those lessons, I will be asking you some questions. When I ask you questions, you have to answer me as loudly as you can. This is my way of knowing that you are alive. This is the only way I know you're still there. Okay? And this is not a khutbah of Jum'ah, so it's okay, you can speak. It's fine, you can call it out. I actually need you to speak to me loudly, all together, inshallah ta'ala. But some of you get really excited and you raise your hand, like you have a personal question. I will not take personal questions, there's like 3,000 of you here, I can't do that. But all together you can call out answers, okay? So what were the two things in Hamd? That's the loudest you can do, really? Praise and thanks, very good, okay. Praise and thanks. Now the next piece, that before, before I get into the surah itself, the next piece I want to ask you to understand is the difference between a noun and a verb. Sounds like English class. The difference between what? Noun and verb. This is important. If we're going to appreciate the Fatiha, then this is important. A noun is a person, or a place, or a thing, or an idea. This is a noun. Right? Masjid is a noun. Because it's a place. Nu'man is a noun. Because it's a person. Hamd is a noun. Because it's an idea. Hamd is also a noun. That's a noun. Basic definition. What was the other thing? There was noun and what? What was the other thing? Verb. A verb is something either it is past tense, or it's present tense, or it's future tense. So if you say, I prayed, what is that? What tense is that? That's past tense. If I say, I pray, that is present tense. If you say, I will pray, that is future tense. That's all verbs. You understand? Now, this ayah, Allah Azza wa says, Alhamdulillah. Hamd, I'm not translating it now, Hamd is for Allah. So Hamd is not a verb, Hamd is a noun. When the khatib gives his khutbah, he says, Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu, wa nasta'iluhu, wa nasta'afiruhu. You heard this before? Right before you go to sleep, you hear that? Right? Nahmaduhu, wa nasta'iluhu, wa nasta'afiruhu. Now he says, we praise Allah. He says, we praise Allah. Is that past tense or present tense or future tense? We praise Allah. That's present tense, right? So that's a verb. So the khatib uses a verb. But Allah, when He said Alhamdulillah, what did He use? He used a noun. So there's a difference we have to understand. Why don't we say, we praise Allah? نَحْمَدُ اللَّهَ رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ مَالِكِ يَمِّنِي No. Allah makes us say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Now I told you, noun is a person, place, thing, or idea, and a verb is either what? What is it again? Either past tense, or present tense, or future tense. Tell me about a noun. Is a noun past tense, or present tense, or future tense? No. A noun does not have tense. A noun does not have tense. You know what that means? A noun is permanent. A noun is permanent, and a verb is what? If a noun is permanent, then a verb is temporary. It's not forever. Allah used Alhamd because His Hamd is permanent. 
If, if we say we praise Allah, that's present tense, which means we said nothing about the past. Was there hamd of Allah in the past? Yes, but we didn't say it. Is there going to be hamd of Allah in the future? Yes, but we didn't say it. We only talked about what? The present. That's limited. But Allah describes His hum that covers the past, it covers the present, it covers the future. It is beyond time. So He says alham is permanent. There's a big difference between saying I praise Allah and we praise Allah and alham belongs to Allah. It's permanent. You understand that first point? Now the second point. When I say I praise Allah, who's praising Him? I am. If I say you praise Allah, who's praising Him? You are. If I say the Muslims praise Allah, then who is it that's praising Allah? The Muslims. In other words, whenever you have a verb, you have to have someone to do it. You cannot just have a verb, you have to have someone who does it. You cannot just say ate. Who ate? You cannot just say died. You have to tell me what? Who does? Somebody has to do the verb. You can't just have a verb by itself. Can you have a noun by itself? Yes. A noun doesn't need someone to do it, but a verb needs someone to do it. If we, if Allah gave us Nahmadullah, we praise Allah, then who would be doing the praise? We. But the hamd of Allah does not need a doer. Whether all of us are doing the hamd of Allah or none of us are doing the hamd of Allah, if the entire samawat, wal ard, the skies and the earth, all of creation is doing the hamd of Allah or nothing is doing the hamd of Allah, there is still the hamd of Allah. It does not depend on us. See, a verb depends on the doer. But a noun depends on nothing. A noun depends on nothing. So Allah made His hamd independent of us. Whether you and I do hamd of Him or not, it is still there. Whether I remember Him or not, the hamd of Allah is still a fact. The hamd of Allah is still a fact. It's a reality. It's beyond us. SubhanAllah. The reason I'm telling you these examples is because we say Alhamdulillah all the time. And sometimes, from, because I'm a student of language, in language there are many ways of saying things. You can praise Allah in many ways. You can say, Hamd belongs to Allah. You can say, we praise Allah. We can say, you must praise Allah. Praise Allah. Like an exclamation, like a command, you could say that. But does it make a difference? Yes, it does. And which one did Allah choose? The perfect one. If you choose any other option, something is missing. And that's why I want to explore all the options. What are these other options? And why are they missing something? And when you explore all of these options, you really appreciate how perfect Alhamdulillah is. How perfect it is. Now let's take another step. I told you the difference between what two things now? What two things I forgot? You tell me now. Nouns and? Which one is permanent? Come on, come on, come on. Nouns, which one is temporary? Verbs are temporary. Allah used which one? In Alhamdulillah. He used a noun. Used alhamd. Now, what if you say, Hamdun lillah, not alhamdulillah? You see the al in the beginning? Alhamdulillah. Why not just say, Hamdun lillah? Just take the lam off. You know what that would mean? That would mean, some hamd belongs to Allah. Some hamd belongs to Allah. But by putting al, it's called namal istirraq, which means all hamd. Every hamd, the perfect hamd, belongs to Allah. So even the an is important. Even that's important. Now let me take you even further. You have to pay extra attention to this part. This is a hard part. But I have to try to make it as simple to understand as possible. The khatib gets up and he says, Inna alhamdulillah. When he's really excited, he doesn't say, Inna alhamdulillah. He says, Inna alhamdulillah. And you're like, oh, this is going to be one of those powerful sublas. Now, what word does he use in the first word? What did he say? Inna. Does the Quran say, Inna alhamdulillah, Rabbil alameen? No. Anyone know what Inna means? It means for sure, without a doubt, definitely. 
Definitely. I don't like to use verily because I don't know what that means. I don't know. Have you ever used verily in your life? Anywhere? You go to the store and say, verily, I need a discount? Do you ever say that? No? So if you don't use it, then don't, don't, you don't have to use it for translating Quran. Okay, leave it alone. For sure, definitely, hamd belongs to Allah. Now, doesn't that sound powerful when you say definitely, hamd belongs to Allah? It's a very powerful way of speaking. The question is, if it's powerful, then how come Allah didn't say it? Allah says in the Quran, Inna Allaha ala kulli shay'in qadir. Doesn't He say that? Inna Allaha alimun bidhat al sudur. He says that. Inna Allaha bima ta'amalun khabir. He says that. He says in Allah all the time. How come he doesn't say why? In Alhamdulillah, I'm even more confused because the Khatib says it. The Khatib has no problem saying it. So what's the difference between in Alhamdulillah and Alhamdulillah? And why is Alhamdulillah perfect? Why is it perfect? I have to tell you the difference between two more things. First I told you the difference between nouns and Verbs. Now I have to tell you the difference between two kinds of sentences. Sentences of information, sentences of information, and sentences of emotion. Sentences of information and sentences of emotion. So informational sentences and emotional sentences. Let me give you a simple example. If I am teaching you, I am giving you what? Information. Information. So I am teaching you something about Alhamdulillah. That is informational. If somebody comes to me, some non-Muslim comes to me, a Buddhist comes to me and says, I want to learn about Islam. And I say, in Islam, all praise belongs to Allah. Alhamdulillah. I'm teaching him. Is this informational or emotional? This is informational. I get a phone call. I get a phone call. On the phone call, my wife says, the baby she went to the doctor, she's okay. The baby's okay. And what do I say when I hear the baby's okay? I say Alhamdulillah. But when I say Alhamdulillah, am I being informational or emotional? It's emotional. So sometimes I say Alhamdulillah and it's information. And sometimes I say Alhamdulillah and it is what? Emotion. Okay, for those of you that are students of Arabic, this could be the difference between Jumla Insha'iyah and Jumla Khabariyah, but that's okay, it doesn't increase your Iman, relax. It's information versus what? Emotion, that's what I gave you. Now here's the rule of Arabic. The rule of Arabic is if you use Inna, if you use what? Inna, it can only be informational. If it is Inna, it has to be about what? Information. And if it is about information, it cannot be about what? It cannot be about emotion. But if you don't use inna, then it could be informational and it could be emotional. When the student of tafsir is sitting down with the books and he's learning about Alhamdulillah, his experience of Alhamdulillah is informational. But when that same student is standing in front of Allah and reciting the Fatiha, then Alhamdulillah is what? It's emotional. You see? Allah kept both. So that it's not just speaking about our, about our aqal. Alhamdulillah is also about our aqal, about our heart. That's also about the emotion. It's perfect. The khatib is informing you. He's reminding you. So he says it's Alhamdulillah. That's fine. But Allah is speaking about both, the heart and the mind, so He says Alhamdulillah. Now we go to, let's go on. So I gave you the comparison between nouns and verbs. I gave you the comparison between emotional and informational. Just to appreciate Alhamdulillah a little bit. Let's take some more steps. One more step. What if we say, Ihmadullah, praise Allah, like a command. Isn't Allah the authority so He has the right to command us? He could tell us to do something. So He could just, He could have said, Ihmadullah Rabbil Alameen. Do Alhamdulillah. Do it. It could have been a command. Now let me tell you about commands. First of all, commands are interesting language because when, when you give a command, there are only two possibilities. If I give my daughter a command, 
I tell my daughter, Hosta, Hosta, bring me some water. I gave her a command. There are two possibilities. Here's possibility number one. She will bring me some water. Here's possibility number two. She will bring me some water. There's two different possibilities. Now for the rest of you, there may be two different possibilities. I ask you to do something, either you do it or you don't do it. If you do it, it happened. If you don't do it, it didn't happen. In other words, the ball is in your court. You are in charge now because it's your responsibility now. Allah did not say you, praise Allah, because then it would depend on us. But the hamd of Allah doesn't depend on us. It doesn't depend on us. That would mean if we do it, it happened. If we didn't do it, the hum didn't happen. No, no, no. Hum is already there. Wallahu ghani, huwa ghaniyul hamid. One time uh, when I was in college, there was an atheist student who came to me and said, Why does your God want us to praise Him so much? Why does He want us to pray to Him five times, say alhamdulillah, say praise Him all the time? Why does He need our praise? And I said, listen, my, my kafir friend, uh, I want to explain to you that actually in Islam, Allah does not need your hamd. How do I know? Because He said, Alhamdulillah. He doesn't need us. It's already there. It's already a fact. You can't change it. So I told you, in Alhamdulillah, that is just informational, and Alhamdulillah is informational and also emotional. But you know when you have Eid and Ramadan is coming, after Ramadan there's going to be Eid and in Eid you're going to dress nicely and you're going to stay up after Fajr for a change. And when you stay up after Fajr, you're going to walk to the prayer. When you walk to a prayer, you're going to take a different path. Not your normal way, you're going to take a different way. And when you're walking and you're going, what are you going to be saying? What are you going to be saying when you're walking to the prayer? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar What's the last part? Walillahi alhamd Walillahi alhamd The Fatiha says what? Alhamdulillah You say what? Lillahi alhamd What's the difference? Is it the same words? It's the same words, Alhamdulillah and what? Lillahi Alhamd. It's the same words, but the difference is what? The reverse. Lillahi was at the end, now it's in the beginning. Alhamdu was in the beginning, now it's at the end. They're flipped over. Is, does it make a difference? Everything makes a difference. Everything makes a difference. Why do we say Lillahi Alhamd? How come Allah says what? Alhamdulillah. He doesn't say Lillahi Alhamd. He says Alhamdulillah. Actually, at the end of Surah Al-Jathiyah, at the end of Surah number 45, he does say, وَلِلَّهِ الْحَمْدِ رَبُّ السَّمَوَاتِ وَرَبُّ السَّمَوَاتِ وَرَبِّ الْأَرْضِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ He does say, لِلَّهِ الْحَمْدِ He does say it in the Qur'an. Many times he says, Alhamdulillah, like, Alhamdulillahi الَّذِي أَنْزَلَ عَلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ الْكِتَابَ وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ عِوَجَ He says it. He says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, he says it, but sometimes he also says what? Lillahi Alhamd, so there has to be a difference. Now let me explain this to you in English, easy to understand each other. I say, which one would you pick? Which one is normal? I'll give you two choices. Choice number one, I prayed Maghrib. That's choice number one, I prayed Maghrib. Here's choice number two, Maghrib I prayed. Choice number one was, I prayed Maghrib. Choice number two, Maghrib, I prayed. Which one is normal English? First one is, is normal, yes? Even though Maghrib, I prayed, is, it sounds like Star Wars a little bit, you know, but still, it's understandable. It's still understandable, Maghrib, I prayed. It's strange, but it's still good English, actually. Which one is normal? I ate lunch or lunch I ate? I ate lunch, that's normal. Lunch I ate sounds strange. Okay? I saw you. You I saw. Which one is normal? I saw you. Hamd belongs to Allah. To Allah belongs Hamd. Which one is normal? 
You tell me, call it. Hamd belongs to Allah, to Allah belongs Hamd. Which one is normal? Hamd belongs to Allah is normal. I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong. I'm saying one of them is normal and one of them is unusual. It's not wrong, it's just unusual. It's not normally used. You understand? Now here's the secret behind it. When the Arabs use this unusual order, then actually what they mean by that is only. When they use the unusual order, then they mean what word? Only. They don't have to say the word only. They just use an unusual order. In other words, I ate lunch is normal, but if you say what? What's the, what's the strange way of saying I ate lunch? Lunch, I ate. The Arab actually means by that, I only ate lunch. I did not have breakfast, I did not have dinner, only lunch. That's what he means. So when he makes the sequence, the order strange, he means what word? What's the word that comes in? Only. I'll give you an example about that. When I used to be a teacher, I used to have boys and girls in my class, and there were two girls I remember, Zainab and Fatima in the back. They used to talk to each other all the time. So I called Zainab, hey Zainab. She says, I wasn't the only one. <laughs> now when she says, I wasn't the only one, what is she saying? If I'm going to the principal's office, Fatima's coming with me. You understand? But she did not say, Fatima was talking to. I was also, I wasn't the only one, it was also Fatima. She only used the word what? Only. And just because she used the word only, I understood that she's telling me something more. She's telling me something more. If somebody says, I'm not your only friend, I am not your only friend, then what are they saying? You have more friends. That they, they mean something more. Allah says, Hamd only belongs to Allah. When He says, Lillahi al-Hamd, Lillahi al-Hamd, when we say, when we pray the, when we're praying the, the Eid prayer, we say, Lillahi al-Hamd. Surah so Al-Jadhiya says, Lillahi al-Hamd. Lillahi al-Hamd means, Hamd only belongs to Allah. You understand? Now when you say Hamd only belongs to Allah, are you saying something else too? Yes. You know what you're saying? Hamd only belongs to Allah. Finish it. Think. Finish. Hamd only belongs to Allah. It does not belong to anyone else. Now when do you talk like that? Hey, Hamd only belongs to Allah. It does not belong to anyone else. You talk like that when you are debating with someone, when you're arguing with someone, when you're correcting someone, when you're fixing someone. Then you say, hey, Hamd only belongs to Allah, not anybody else. You understand? Now Surah Al-Jatiyah, Surah al the whole Surah is a debate, is a debate with the people who do shirk. Debate with who? The people who do what? Shirk. Now if the people who do shirk, they do hamd of Allah, it's true. They do hamd of Allah. But the problem is they do hamd of other things too. If you tell a mushrik, Alhamdulillah, maybe he has no problem. He says, okay, I'm good. Hamd belongs to Allah. And also, then he adds some more. This actually happened to me one time. I was driving in Louisiana. And I was, I was running out of gas, so I stopped for, for gas in my car. And it's a bad idea to stop in Louisiana, but I stopped. And a guy pulled over and he had a pickup truck and a shotgun in the back and a cowboy hat. And, and I had a phone on. And I'm getting gas and he's getting gas and he looks at me. And he goes, you from Islam, <laughs> I was like, no, from New York. <laughs> But then I just said to him, I said something to him. I said, hey, praise the Lord. I said to him, praise the Lord. And he goes, amen, brother. I agree. And walked away. Because when I say praise the Lord, what's he thinking? Maybe he's thinking Jesus, maybe he's thinking so. I don't know what he's thinking. You understand? And I'll come to that in a second. When, when, when the mushrikun were told, Hamd only belongs to Allah, this was important because they have to learn that Hamd is only for Allah. But when Muslims are talking to each other, 
When Muslims are talking to each other, when I'm talking to my mother, I'm talking to my wife, I'm talking to my father, I'm talking to my brother, I don't say, hey, Baba, humble only belongs to Allah, okay? Nobody else. You got it? You good? Okay. So I don't say, Lillah, Alhamdulillah. What do I say to him? Alhamdulillah. So the one who knows, the one who knows, you say to him what? Alhamdulillah. The one who doesn't know and is doing the wrong thing, what do you say to him? Lillah alhamd. You know why that's beautiful? Because Allah told us in Fatiha that every human being already knows. It is inside of them. It is in their fitrah. So there's no need to argue with them. You begin Fatiha with Alhamdulillah because inside the heart of every human being, there is no argument. There is no argument. That's why it begins with Alhamdulillah. If the Fatiha began with Lillah alhamd, that means the Quran begins with arguing with people. Debating with people. The Quran did not begin with that. Sometimes there is need for debate. So Allah debated them. Now I said it three times. Tell me which surah? Which surah? Jathiyah. Allah did debate. Sometimes there's a need for debate. But for all of humanity and all of the believers, there's no need for debate. So He begins. Alhamdulillah. Now, let's move a little further. We say Alhamdulillah. What's the next words? Rabbil Alameen. What if I said this? Tell me what's missing. If I say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Hamd belongs to Rabbil Alameen. What's missing? The word Allah. Why, why do you have to have the word Allah there? You could just say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Or Alhamdulillah Rahman. Or Alhamdulillah Rahim. Or Alhamdulillah Khaliq. Allah has so many names. You could pick any name. Why put the word Allah there? What point is that? What's the benefit of it? Let me tell you something. When you get introduced to someone, for the first time you meet someone, you say, Assalamu Alaikum. Then what do you say? What's the first thing you say? My name is so and so. And after you introduce them with your name, then you tell them something about yourself. You do not meet someone new at the airport when you turn to them and say, Assalamu Alaikum. I'm a teacher. Assalamualaikum, my name is Abdul Kareem, I'm a teacher. You understand? First you say your name, then you describe yourself. Fatiha is Allah introducing us to Himself. Allah is introducing Himself. And when you introduce yourself, what's the most important thing? Your name. Name is important. Here's the other thing. But then Allah Himself says He has many names. Give me one of Allah's names, call it out. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Al Khaliq, what else do I hear? Come on. Al Quddus, Al Jabbar, Al Aziz, yes? Now tell me something. If we say Alhamdulil Khaliq, then Hamd is for the Creator, yes? So that means I am only grateful to Him and I'm only thanking Him because He did what? He created. If I say Alhamdulil Hakim, I'm only grateful for his wisdom. If I say Alhamdulil Alim, I'm only grateful for his knowledge. If I say Alhamdulil Quddus, I'm only grateful for his sanctity, his purity. If I say Alhamdulil Rahman, I'm only grateful for his mercy and his love. But I want to be grateful for him, for his guidance and his creation and his mercy and all of it, all at the same time. That's too many names. Oh my God, how am I going to thank Allah for everything? Allah, only He can teach us. So He gave us one word. One word. And that one word has all of Allah's name inside it. All of them at the same time. Which one word is that? Allah. So He said, you say Alhamdulillah. There's no better way to praise Allah than Alhamdulillah. You can't do it. Anything else would be limited. Anything else would be limited. Now understand one more thing here. This is actually really fun. We'll talk about this on Sunday, those of you that are staying for the whole seminar, inshaAllah. Musa alayhi salam was with Harun alayhi salam and they were arguing and debating with who? And finally Musa alayhi salam had a, had a challenge with the magicians. And the magicians eventually were defeated and when they were defeated they fell into sajda. The, the magicians fell into sajda and Fir'aun is confused. Look, what happened? Are you tired? You need a break? Or uh, you want to take five minute recess? We come back and discuss more? What do you want to do? So they don't, he doesn't understand what happened. Fir'aun is confused. So they get up from sajda. The magicians get up from sajda in Surah Al-Shu'ara. 
and they say, Amanna bi Rabbil Alameen. Amanna bi Rabbil Alameen. We believe in Rabbil Alameen. Did they say, Amanna billahi Rabbil Alameen or Amanna bi Rabbil Alameen? Amanna bi Rabbil Alameen. No mention of Allah. So they only said, we believe in the Rabb. The problem is, Musa السلام, is talking against who? Fir'aun. And Fir'aun thinks that he is himself what? He thinks he's wrong. Doesn't he think he's wrong? He says in Quran, فَقَالَ قَالَ أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْعَلَىٰ He calls himself wrong. So when the magicians say, we believe in the Rabb, what might Fir'aun think? Fir'aun might think, I know. <laughs> You see, there's room for confusion. So the magicians, they said, Amanna bi Rabbil Alameen. Then they turned to Fir'aun and said, No, stupid. Rabbi Musa wa Harun. That's the next ayah. <laughs> Not you, the Rabb of Musa and Harun. Not you. <laughs> because when you don't mention the word Allah, is it possible somebody else believes in the, uh, in the incorrect Rabb? Is that possible? Fir'aun believed in himself as Rabb. The mushrik might believe in something else as well. So if the Fatiha began with Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, everybody else might have a different concept of love. So Allah made it explicitly clear, this will begin with Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So there's no confusion left, do you understand? When I started this, this is the last part before your five minute break now, last part. I started by saying there's a difference between praise and Thanks. Now I have to explain that difference. We have to understand that difference. And Alhamd includes what? Both praise and thanks. If it was only thanks, if it was only thanks, the words would be Ash-Shukrulillah. If it was only praise, it would be Al-Madhulillah or al thanaulillah That would be only the praise. But Allah said Alhamdulillah, which is both praise and thanks. يعني جمع بين الشكر والثناء. Okay, you combine both of them. Now, let's understand this a little bit. You go to a family, family's house who had a baby. They have a aqiqa party. You go to their house, you see the baby. Do you praise the baby or do you thank the baby? You praise the baby. Oh, so cute. Even it looks like an old man, you still say, oh, cute, so cute. And when you're saying it's so cute, and it's so hairy, and it's so, it looks like a dinosaur, whatever you're saying, you're not thanking, you're what? Praising. When you walk by a nice car, you walk by a nice car, you walk by a Porsche or something, do you praise the car or you thank the car? It's a nice car. You don't go to the hood of the car and thank you. Thank you, Porsche. You don't do that. If you do that, see me afterwards. I have some psychiatrists that I can recommend to you. You don't do that. So you praise, but you don't what? You don't thank. So sometimes you can praise without thanking. It's possible. There are people watching the World Cup. They're praising the team, but they're not what? They're not thanking the team. They're not thanking the team. Now, sometimes you can thank without praising. That's also possible. Let me give you an example. Ibrahim السلام, was raised in a house that was full of shirk. So his father and some of us will say his uncle, Aza, builds idols. Ibrahim السلام, is commanded. He has to be grateful to his parents. Anishkurli waliwalika is a commandment to all prophets. All prophets brought the same thing. So he has to be, he has to say thanks to his father. He thanks him, but he will never what? He can't praise him. He can't praise what he does. But he still has to what? Thank him. Musa السلام, was raised under Fir'aun. Musa السلام, will thank him. He will thank him. In the Quran, وَتِلْكَ نِعْمَةٌ تَهُنُّهَا عَلَيَّ That is a favor you did for me. I owe you praise. I, uh, rather, I owe you thanks. But he will never what? He won't praise him. What I'm trying to tell you is there's a difference. Sometimes you only praise and sometimes you only thank. Those are two different things. Alhamdulillah. What are we saying? Praise and thank. 
at the same time. Now in English, I have to use two words. Praise and thanks. And when in linguistics, when you use two words, you are separating them. In other words, sometimes I praise him and sometimes I thank him. But in the Arabic of the Quran, it is one word, which means both of those things are always together all the time. I don't praise Allah sometimes and thank Him some other times. I always praise Him along with, at the same time, I also thank Him. They are never separated. In other words, when you see a beautiful mountain, you don't just praise Allah, you also thank Allah. And when you are going through difficulty, and I am going through difficulty, Akhi, how are you doing? Well, I lost my job. How's the finances? Things are pretty bad. Well, Alhamdulillah. Now sometimes people say Alhamdulillah, but they don't mean it. Like, yeah, Alhamdulillah. Does that sound like you're thinking or praising? The entire, the attitude. By the way, Alhamd. Remember, it's not only informational, it is also what? Emotional. So you have to have the emotion of praising Allah and thanking Allah when you say Alhamdulillah. You have to have both of those things. No matter what is happening in the life of a Muslim, he goes back to this one thing and everything is fine. And that one thing is Alhamdulillah. This is one thing. Everything becomes, it works out. It works out. We have to have the attitude that we praise and thank Allah for everything that He does. فَنَشْكُرُهُ عَلَى الْمَصَائِبِ كَمَا نَشْكُرُهُ عَلَى الْنِعَمِ We thank Him in difficult times the same way we thank Him in easy times. That's Alhamdulillah. You remember Alhamdulillah is permanent? Do you remember that? Which means, no matter what is happening, Alhamdulillah is still true. No matter what is happening in your life, this is a reality, it doesn't change. The weather changes, your health changes, life changes, Alhamdulillah doesn't change. But for some people, Alhamdulillah is working in Ramadan, Alhamdulillah is working when the money is good, and Alhamdulillah disappears when money disappears. Alhamdulillah disappears when family problems start. You can't, it's permanent. Allah described it Himself as permanent. So we have to have a permanent attitude towards the hamd of Allah. So these were a few lessons from just what? Alhamdulillah. I don't know how we're going to get through the whole Fatiha. <laughs> it will go faster from here, inshallah. I promise. It'll go. The first one I had to go on. But can you imagine the scholars of Islam, the ulama of Tafsir, they went through the entire Quran word by word by word by word like this and said, why is this so beautiful? Why is this so perfect? What is the benefit of this? What is the benefit of that? What if I say it another way? Why isn't it good enough? And they did this exercise for the entire Quran. SubhanAllah. What an incredible book. What other book is there going to be where scholars and people will dedicate their whole life exploring every word like they're figuring out a treasure? There are people who put less effort into finding treasures in the earth and we're trying, we're trying to find the treasures in Allah's word. May Allah Azza wa make that struggle easy for us. Now sit, relax, make a new friend, say salam alaikum to them, while I walk over peacefully over there and say salam to the sisters and take some questions for five minutes. I have a watch. Five minutes, I'll be back. No pictures. Okay. Yeah. Ready? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam wa ala ishraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in from ma ba'ad once again As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Okay, let's speed this up. We finished some discussion on Alhamdulillah. Now we have to talk a little bit about Rabbil Alameen. And the first thing I'd like to share with you is I am reminding you that Allah is introducing Himself to us in the surah. And after He says Alhamdulillah, the first description of Himself, after Lafzul Jalala, after the word Allah, the first description He chose out of all of His descriptions was Rabbil Alameen. So it must be the first foundation of our relationship with Him. It must be something very important that establishes my relationship with Allah before anything else. He is lots of things. He's also a Rahman al Rahim. He's also Maliki al Middin. He's also many other things. But the first thing you and I need to know is what? Rabbil Alameen. After his name, the first thing you needed to know. This is in the wisdom of Allah. So, why? What's the benefit of that? The word Rabb is very deep, it's very rich. They say in Arabic, Rabb wa al Malik wa Sayyid wa al Murabbi wa al Mun'im wa al Qayyim. Now, what that means 
I'll go piece by piece. The first meaning of Rabb is the owner. And I'm, I'm going to expect you to remember this now. The first meaning is what? Owner. The second one is the one in charge. The one in charge. What was the first meaning? Owner. Second one? The one in charge. Now you might think it's the same thing. The owner is the one in charge. Not all the time. Sometimes you own a house. But you own a house in a neighborhood, you want to put a wall, and the, the government says, or the city says, or the neighbor says, no, you can't put a wall here. And you have to apply for a permit, and you have to put in an application, and all of this. In other words, you own the house, but you are not what? You're not in charge. You're not in charge. You buy a car, and you own the car. But when you want to make modifications to your car, what about it? What do I do? Huh? Untangle it? Okay. You happy? Okay. Okay. What was I saying? Something about Islam. What were they talking about? Something about cars. Yes, very good. If you make changes to your car, some of those changes are illegal. So you own it, but you're still not completely what? In charge. The first meaning of Rab is the one who owns something. Also, someone who is? in charge. This is a saying. Well, murabbi. The third meaning of Rab is someone who grows something. Like you, when you grow a plant, or when you raise children, you're a murabbi. Someone who allows something to grow and takes care of it. So that's the third meaning. You can even call it the caretaker. It's easy to remember. So the owner, and the one in charge, and the caretaker. Three meanings so far. Then al munim The one who gives gifts. The one who gives gifts. So let's go from the beginning. What was number one? Owner. Number two? The one in charge. Number three? Caretaker. And the fourth? The one who gives gifts. And al qayyim you can call it the maintainer. And I'll explain that last, the maintainer part. Let's go to the beginning. Allah owns you and me. Allah owns you and me. And I, I think all of us understand the concept of ownership. You own a pen, you own a laptop, you own a phone. You own a car, you own these things. When you own something, sometimes you don't have full authority, but Allah actually has full authority. Now when you own something, is it guaranteed that you will take care of it? When you and I own something, do we always take care of it? Do you take care of all of your clothes, all of your shoes, all of your technology? You know, some of you have a whole, your house is just wires, right? And VCRs from 1987 and you know, you have this stuff, you don't take care of it, but it's there. You have, in, in, in the back of your house, you have like four bicycles, and they're all getting rusted, and your mother gets angry at you all the time, but you don't move it. You own it, but you don't what? Take care of it. Sometimes you own something, and you don't have authority. Sometimes you own something, but you don't take care of it. Allah owns you and me. He has absolute authority over you and me. And He what? takes care of you and me. When I own something, I don't necessarily take care of it. Allah does. Allah does. Then the other issue here is why, why I say the you know, gift giver. Giver of gifts. What's the benefit of the al -mun Because whatever Allah gives you, definitely it is a gift. It, it's not anything else, it's a gift. When your boss gives you a check, is that a gift? No, you earned it. You worked hard and you earned it. But when Allah gives you, it is never something you earned. We don't earn anything with Allah. We only get gifts from Allah. That's all we get. There's a big difference now. When your paycheck is less than what you expected. You accept, expected a check for 1,000, you got a check for 800. You complain? Because you deserved it. But when you get a gift of 800, use a hit. Eid Mubarak. Check should have been, it's Eid. You, you write a check for 1,000, what's the matter with you? What kind of gift is this? You do that? You're really messed up if you do that. Talk to me afterwards if you have that problem. When you get a gift, then you know that you didn't deserve it. It's not something to expect. If you expect it, it's a salary, it's payment. But it's a gift. Now what that does for you and me, a 
lies than saying you have five fingers on your hand or some of you have four fingers on your hand. Some of you have walked straight, some of you walk with a limp. But both of your legs, or no legs at all, everything you have or whatever you don't have, if you don't have, you don't get to complain because you didn't earn it. That's all a gift. Yukti man yasha, he gives it to whoever he wants. Nothing I have is my own actually. I myself, I don't even belong to myself. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. You know, I worry about the clothes I wear, the house I live in, the property I own, all of these things. But at the end of the day, I myself am the property of Allah. I am going under the ground. I am going back to the earth of Allah. And then I am reminding, you are reminding each other when you are burying me, you are saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Just like this one belongs to Allah, it's proof. He did not own himself, Allah took him. It was his and Allah took what is his. Just like that one day, we are his and one day he'll take us. One day we'll be gone. This is inside the word Rabb. When Qayyim, the one who maintains the last meaning of Mun'im, or, or the one, last meaning of Rabb, the one who maintains. You know what that means? That means that you and I are not capable of living from one breath to the next breath. We are not capable of living from one second to the next second. The only one who is allowing us to, keep, to maintain our life is Allah. In other words, Allah is never absent from your life. Some people when they have difficult times, they say, where is Allah? Where was Allah when I needed Him? You know what? Your heart is still beating, right? That's not because you put a battery inside. Your lungs are still contracting and expanding. That's not because you paid a rent check. You didn't pay for that. Allah was doing that for you, and He's still doing that for you. And the tongue you're using to complain about Allah, guess who is making that tongue work at the time that you're complaining about Allah? That is Allah too. The voice that is coming out of your throat is from Allah. He's always there. He's love. He's maintaining. He's maintaining. Now, I'm going to say some words to you, and you tell me the other end. All of these words are a relationship. On the one hand, you have teacher. On the other hand, you have student. On the one hand, you have parent. On the other hand, you have child. On the one hand, you have wife. On the other hand, you have victim. On the one hand, you have... <laughs> so in all of these, there is one... One side is this, the other side is that. One side is this, the other side is that. You understand? These are relationships. In relationships, everybody gets a label. Some of Allah's names, there's a relationship. And some of Allah's names, there is no relationship. For example, when Allah says He's wise, there's no relationship. But when Allah says He is the Creator, then what's the relationship? On the one hand, there's the Creator. On the other hand, there's the creation. Is the creation. On the one hand, there is the giver. On the other hand, there is the receiver. Now, the word Rabb, owner. Of all the meanings, I'm just giving you one, owner. That's on the one side. What's on our side? If Allah is owner, what am I? I'm property. Isn't that what it is? The term used for human property is Abd. The term used when human beings are property, they are called Abd. So Allah is Rabb and I am Abd. That's what I am. By calling himself Rabb, automatically he called me a Abd. But sometimes you have a teacher, but you have a student who doesn't know that he's a student. Sometimes you have a parent, but the child is not like acting like a son. Sometimes you have a husband and the wife is not acting like a wife or you have a wife and the husband is not acting like a husband. And here you have a Rabb. You have a Rabb. And sometimes you have people and they don't like act like what? They don't act like Abd. They don't act like Abd. This one word is actually the summary of the entire Quran my teacher used to tell me. He said the one thing Allah wants you to know about him is that he is Rabb and that you are Abd. And you will, every day you will forget. Every day you will forget a little bit or a lot that Allah is Rabb and you are Abd. And you will make mistakes and you have to remind yourself, Hey, he's Rabb, I'm Abd, he's Rabb, I'm Abd. You have to keep reminding yourself. And that is the essence of the Qur'an. 
the summary of the entire Quran is accept the fact that you are what? Abd. And accept the fact that Allah is? Allah, that's it. And you're fine. But there's a problem. There's a big problem. You know, in the United States, when I teach the same course, I used to teach it a long time ago. When I talk about Abd, how do I translate Abd? Slave. And in America, we used to have slavery a couple of centuries ago. So somebody said to me, oh, says, I don't like slavery. And slavery is bad. Slavery means you put people in chains. Slavery means you whip them and you punish them and you torture them and you take away their respect and their dignity and you treat them like animals. And by the way, in human history, are slaves treated like animals? Yes. Are they put in chains? Yes. Are they humiliated? Absolutely. The example of human slavery in the Quran is Banu Israel and Abbatta Bani Israel. Fir'aun had made them into slaves and they were humiliated. He was humiliating you with the worst kind of torture. And actually this means that this slavery itself is humiliating. Human beings want to be free. So the moment a human being thinks, I'm a slave, slaves have no respect. By the way, somebody's a teacher, somebody's an accountant, somebody's a doctor, somebody's a janitor, somebody's a masjid cleaner, somebody's an imam, somebody's a scholar, but the lowest lowest title available in humanity. There is no lower title available in humanity. You know what the lowest title is? Slave. There's nothing worse than slave. <laughs> There's no lower job description. Everybody else is better than slave. <laughs> this is the lowest one available. Allah took for Himself Rabb and He gave you and me what? Out. And nobody likes to be at the bottom. <coughs> but the, the unique thing is, in America, when they had slavery, did the slaves love their master or hated their master? They hated their master. First chance they got to get free, they got free. Some of them tried to run away and got killed while trying to get run away. Some of them were tortured because they disobeyed their masters. In other words, the slaves don't love their master, the slaves what? Hate their master. Then emotionally, emotionally, they never thank their master and they never Praise their master. Allah is the only Rabb that before you even know He is Rabb, you do hamd of Him. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. There will never be any Rabb other than Allah who will ever get hamd. There are people that can try to be Rabb. They tried. Fir'aun tried. And he can have, maybe some people consider him Rabb, but he will never have what? He'll never have hamd. He'll never have it. That's only for Allah. So Allah says that you will praise and thank Him and appreciate Him before you even enter into this relationship. And He says, Rabbil Alameen. I won't go into too many details tonight, I'll keep it simple. So just so you can remember the main lessons. Al Alameen is actually used in the Arabic language, not just for, the translation says Lord of the Worlds. I don't like the word Lord. I don't like it because it's an old English word. Nobody knows what that means anymore. I like Master. Rabb is Closer to what? Master. Which means, if he's master, we are what again? Slave. I don't even like servant. I don't like servant, because servant is part-time. Slave is what? Full-time. Servant is only servant when he's at the job. And when he's done with the job, he's free. But a slave is a slave when he's sleeping, when he wakes up, when he's sick, when he's healthy, when he's young, when he's old, he's a slave. You understand? So I like slave better. It's an honor from Allah to be his slave. Now, Al-Alameen. Al-Alameen actually means nations, peoples. And Alam is used in Arabic, not just for world. It's actually used also for different cultures. So when I come to Malaysia, I say, this is a beautiful Alam. This is a different Alam. Hada Alam al-Akhar. When I travel across the United States, I used to live in New York. When I moved to Texas, I said, this is a different Alam. It's not like New York. People actually say hello. You know, in New York, if somebody says hello to you, run away, <laughs> run away, you know. So Alam actually means different cultures, different nations, different ethnicities, different generations. And Allah is saying now in this ayah, 
he is not just a rub of the Arabs, he is not just a rub of the Indians, he is not just a rub of the Europeans, he is the rub of every nation and every culture and every ethnicity and he takes care of every nation and he loves every nation and he provides for every nation and every ethnicity and every religion. Every human being on this earth belongs to one of the alameen and he is the rub of all of them. He's the rub of all of them. It's a universal message. It's a very powerful message. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. When we understand Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, immediately we understand that He is not only my Rabb, He is the Rabb of all human beings. He's the Rabb of all human beings. Now, I'm going to move along. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. This is my favorite part. I have many favorite parts. But this is the first favorite part. Okay? Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Somebody offer me a translation. Speak out loud. Tell me a translation of Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. You call that out loud? <laughs> most gracious, most merciful. That's a wonderful translation. What does gracious mean? <laughs> Do you use gracious nowadays sometimes? You're so gracious. <laughs> you don't use it. The word Ar Rahman, the words Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, they have to do with two things. They have to do with love. They both have to do with Rahmah. Rahmah includes the meaning of love and care. Love and what? Care. And those two things, the first person you think of in human beings, the first person who think, you think of, they love you and they care for you no matter what, is who? Mother. Which is why the word Rahm is used for the belly of the mother. The closest thing you can imagine within human, the human experience to Rahmah is the mother. Now the relationship between the mother and the child is very simple. It's two main things. I need you to understand those two main things. I already said them. Love and what? Care. So Ar-Rahman has to do with love and care. And Ar-Rahim has to do with love and care. Both of these have to do with love and care. But why does Allah say two different words for love and care? What's the point? So I'm not using the word merciful right now. I'm using loving and caring. Loving and caring. That's what I'm using. Okay. I need you to remember three things about Ar-Rahman. Three things about Ar-Rahman. And then I need you to remember two things about Ar-Rahim. I will not give you the technical details. This is super simple. How many things about Ar-Rahman? Three things. How many things about Ar-Rahim? Two things. Okay, here are the three things about Ar-Rahman. Number one. <coughs> the word is extreme. The word is extreme. I'll explain in a second. That's number one. Number two, the word is right now. It's happening right now. And number three, it's temporary. It is temporary. What were the three things I gave you? Call it out. It's extreme, it's right now, and it's temporary. Let me explain what that means. That means Allah is not just saying that He's loving and caring when He says Allah Rahman. He's saying He's extremely loving and extremely caring. That's number one meaning. Number two meaning. What was the second one after extreme? Allah is not saying that He is loving and caring eventually. Loving and caring in a month. Loving and caring later on. What is He loving and caring? Right now. Meaning Allah is giving you His love and He's giving you His care. Right now, it's happening as we speak. What was the third? That's the scary one. Oh. See, a word Ar-Rahman is a pattern. As it wasn't in the Arabic language, you say Fa'lan. So you say Atshan and Jaw'an and Ghadban. You say different words that sound like Rahman and all of them are temporary. Ghadban means angry. Angry is all the time or temporary? Temporary. Some sisters say, you don't know my husband. He means all like, oh, permanent. But what about Atshan, thirsty? Is that permanent or temporary? It's temporary. What about Jawa'an, uh, hungry? Permanent or temporary? So Rahman is also temporary, but with temporary with a condition. And you should understand the condition. Thirst is temporary only because what takes it away? You need water to get rid of? Thirst. Hunger is temporary only when food is there. Allah's Rahmah is there. Something might come from you to get rid of it. 
So it will only become temporary if you get rid of it. Just like you can get rid of thirst by what? Water. Or you can get rid of hunger by food. You can get rid of Allah's Rahmah by doing something. And we'll learn about that in a little bit. So the three things once again for Allah Rahmah. You tell me now. You tell me. Extreme. Right now. Temporary. How many things you have to know about Allah? Two things. Number one is always. It's permanent. Is that different from Allah Rahman? Why? That was temporary. This one is permanent. Very good. There's the second thing you have to know about Allah. It is not necessarily happening right now. Al Rahim is not necessarily happening right now. Is that different from Al Rahman? What was the thing about Al Rahman? It's happening right now. So there's some sifa. Some sifa is not happening right now. Let me give you an example. I say to someone, my wife is patient. My wife is patient. But I am in Malaysia and she is in Texas right now. Do I know that she is being patient right now? Maybe she's going crazy and breaking plates and... I don't know what she's doing. But I'm telling the brother, my wife is patient. I probably should have. My, my wife is patient. Insha'Allah, wallahu a'lam. <laughs> you understand? You say about someone, that's a nice guy. He's a nice guy. You're, he's not here. You're saying he's a nice guy. Do you know if he's being a nice guy right now? No. No. So the same way you are describing Allah as loving and caring, but the word Rahim does not necessarily mean that Allah is engaged in the act of love and care right now. It doesn't mean that. Now let me tell you what's amazing about these two words. If Allah only said Ar-Rahman, then the Rahmah of Allah would be extreme. It would be right now, but it would not be permanent. It would be something missing. So Allah added what word? Ar-Rahim. And by adding Ar-Rahim, what did it become also? Permanent. The one thing that was missing is covered in Ar-Rahim. But if Allah only said Ar-Rahim, the problem is it would not be like it would not be extreme, and it would not be when? Right now. So by saying Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, now it became extreme, and it became right now, and it became permanent. SubhanAllah. Nothing is left. Nothing is left. But you also have to understand why is Ar-Rahman first and Ar-Rahim second? Why not Ar-Rahim Ar-Rahman? Why not? Let me give you a simple example, you all remember this. I like to give silly examples so you remember these lessons. You go to the office, what day you get paid? You get paid on Friday or what? What day you get your check? End of the month? Okay, so it's the end of the month. Even better, it's the end of the month. And what time you leave your office? Six o'clock? <laughs> this guy says I never leave my office. <laughs> I live there. <laughs> so you leave your office at six o'clock. Now it's 5.30. End of the month. Your boss is supposed to give you your check. But your boss is not there. He calls, he says, I'm stuck in traffic. I won't, I, I'm trying to get there. I think I can make it. Now it's 5.45. It's 5.50. And you have to go. You have to go to Umrah. Your flight is in two hours. And if you don't have this check, you cannot go. And your friend comes to you at the office and says, hey, hey, listen. It's okay. Our boss, he's reliable. He's good. He's good. And you say to him, thank you very much, my brother. My boss is reliable. I, w I just wish he was being reliable when? Right now. I, don't, I know he's reliable, but I don't care. I need his help when? Right now. Human beings, when they are in trouble, they don't care about the future. They care about what? Right now, if you are really hungry and you go home, and the wife says, what do you want to eat next week? <laughs> Woman! Give me some food! <laughs> and once you finish eating your food, and you sit there, ah, then you say, so what do you want to eat next week? <laughs> in other words, when you are in trouble, what do you care about? Right now. When right now is taken care of, then what do you think about? 
the future. If you have no money, then you're thinking about where am I going to eat the next meal. If you have money, then you're thinking about what about the savings, what about the investments, what about college, what about children's money, what about marriage, what about, what about, what about. In other words, when you have the immediate, you, you care about the immediate first, you care about the future later. Allah gave us Ar-Rahman, which is what? Right now. And now that your immediate is taken care of, you start worrying about the future. So Allah gave you Ar-Rahim because that's permanent for the future. He took care of your present and He took care of your future in Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Isn't that beautiful? You know Ibn Abbas ta'ala anhuma said, Ar-Rahman for this dunya, Ar-Rahim is for the Akhirah, for the believers. Which is amazing, because this dunya is temporary, just like the word Ar-Rahman is what? Temporary. And Ar-Rahim is permanent, just like the Akhirah is what? Permanent. It takes me 30 minutes to explain that to you, Ibn Abbas says it in one line. Done. Allah ta'ala anhuma. <laughs> you know, it's so awesome. He just he just hears it. He goes, oh, okay, got it. Subhanallah. <laughs> That's our Rahman. But you know, now I, I take you to Maliki Yomiddin. Thank you so much. When I take you to Maliki Yomiddin, I want to tell you a story. I used to teach kindergarten. Worst job in the world, <laughs> teaching kindergarten. These children, and I used to teach at a school, all the teachers were very strict. Very strict with the kids. So when I went in as a teacher, I said, I'm not going to be strict. I'm going to tell these children stories. I'm going to play with them. I'm going to do tricks for them. I'm going to stand on the table. I'm going to stand upside down on my hands. I'm going to do tricks. They're going to love me. And the teachers who have experience, they looked at me and said, <laughs> have fun. So the first day I go in, I say, okay boys and girls, we're going to have a lot of fun today. And I tell them stories, and I tell them jokes, and the kids are loving it. When the class came to an end, they all said, oh. The next day I walk into class, the kids, and I thought, this is amazing. So three days we did no work. Three days, first three days we did no work. Fourth day I come into class and I say, okay kids, open up the book. Did the children open up the book? No. Hey, tell another story. <laughs> hey, stand on the table again. <laughs> no kids, it's time to open up the book. No! Tell a story. Do it. And I still remember because I have told the story many times, but it still haunts me. There was one child, he was in the back of the class, and he was writing his name on the wall. <laughs> And he was looking at me. <laughs> and his friend came to him. And he said, hey, he's looking at you. The teacher sees you. He said, yeah, but he's a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it is why I told you this story? When you're really nice to someone, then they start thinking that you never get angry, that you can get away with anything, you can get away with anything. And these children, I was always loving and caring to them. So when I decided to tell them that there are rules, they were not ready to listen. Allah in the Quran, if you only told us that He is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, there would be a problem. There would be a problem. You know what we would do? We'd write our name on the wall. Allah is nice. Uh, Allah is Rahman Rahim. Don't worry. Temporary, extreme, permanent. It's all there. So we're good. How about that? You know, you would go into your haram business, and somebody say, "Akhi, make the Quran, leave the business." No, no, ya, Akhi, kareem. Allah Rahman. Why are you worried? Don't worry about it. It's taken care of. So I tell you one more story, so you understand Maliki Yomidin in one second. You just need to understand the story. There's a master and there is a slave. And the master says to the slave, Whatever you want. Listen, but you see that line over there? He drew a line in the grass. He says, don't go on the other side. But you can do whatever you want. Inside, you can do whatever you want. So the slave is playing around, not doing any work. He goes close to the line and he sees the master sitting there. And the master doesn't say anything. The master doesn't say, hey, hey, get away from the line. He doesn't say anything. So the slave goes close to the line and he falls. And he falls on the 
other side. And immediately, where does the slave look? He looks at the master, hey. And the master says nothing, he's just sitting there. So he gets up, and he quickly comes on the other side. He says, sorry, sorry. And the master doesn't say anything. And he goes on. The next day, he pretends to fall. <coughs> and he still checks if he got in trouble. He didn't get in trouble. The next day, he doesn't pretend to fall. He puts one foot on this side, one foot on this side. The master still doesn't say anything. The next day, he's got both feet on the other side. The next day after that, he's, got, he's always on the other side. He's never on this side. A couple of years go by, and the master calls him one day and says, Hey, remember a few years ago, I told you don't go on the other side of that line? You remember that? He goes, Yeah, yeah, I remember. <laughs> Pretty funny. <laughs> and uh, he says, Well, I recorded how many times you went on the other side, and I've decided to punish you for all of those at once. So I'm going to punish you for each of those immediately right now. <laughs> I'm not talking about a master and a slave. I'm talking about Allah and you and me. Allah is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, but He is also what? Maliki Yumi'in. Watch it. Watch it. Immediately He said me. And I, you don't have enough time to cover Maliki and Yawm. I just want to tell you some things about Ad-Din. Ad-Din comes from Dayi, which is exact loan payment. And what you owe someone and what they owe you. In other words, I will take exact calculations from you on Yom al -Din. And it's powerful because on the Day of Judgment, we know that our record, our book will be shown. And it has everything. It leaves nothing big, nothing small. Everything is in there. Except the beauty of it is, there are either people who Allah will go easy on, Allah calls that, Hisaban Yasira. And there are people Allah goes, it's tough on them. So understand this and I'll let you go for your next break. Here's how it works. You know, after 9-11 in the United States, when we travel, there's a lot of extra security on the airport. You have to take your shoes off, you have to take your belt off, you have to go through the scanner, do this, you know, special Muslim treatment, all of it, right? So when I used to first travel, I used to get stopped every time. Obviously, for, you know why. I used to get stopped and check extra, extra special security every time. But after a while, I was traveling to one time to California and I went through the security and I was waiting for the man to say, Sir, could you go over there? Because we have to give you a special hug. But, you know, like they always say, but he didn't call me to special security. He said, go ahead. And I got confused. He said, <laughs> Like, how can you? I am. So immediately the thought came in my head, this is actually a kind of hisab and yasira. Easy hisab. On the day of judgment, we get what in our hand? A book. Some people get a book in their right hand and some people get a book in their left hand. Now this book has what in it? Everything you did. Everything you did, everything you said. From beginning to end. Now, a lot of those things are good and many, many of those things are not so good. So when you go in front of your teacher in school, when you go in front of your teacher with your exam, and you hand the teacher the exam, sometimes the teacher takes the exam and he puts it in his desk. Sometimes the teacher decides to correct the exam in front of you. You ever see that? And you're just standing right there and the pen goes close to the paper and you go like this. Oh, it's a check. And it goes again and it's an excellent oh. You know? So you hand the book over to the angel and he's going to start going through the record. What's happening to you? You're nervous or no? You're scared. This is your book. It's being handed. This is your Din. Everything will be calculated. But for some people Allah says, فَمَنْ أَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَا كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ فَسُوْفَ يُحَاسَبُ حِسَابًا يَسْيرًا You'll be given an easy account. Some people Allah will say, or the angel will say, uh, Sir, and you'll open up to me. Hey, please check page 57. There's Hajj on there. Please look at that one. I think I got some Laylatul Qadr one time. Can you check that one please? You know, like, you know when you show your teacher the best part of your homework? <laughs> but the angel might say to you, Hisab and Yasira, thank you sir, we know, you don't have to show, you can go. It's okay. It's okay. And you're like, really? It's okay? I can go? 
In other words, you don't get checked for every line. The angel just says, it's okay, sir, we understand. You're good. So on the day of judgment, there are two kinds of people. The people who get checked, every item, and the people who get easy account. The people who get checked, the Prophet ﷺ describes, إِنَّهُ مَنْ سُئِلَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَقَدْ هَلَكْ The one who gets interrogated on judgment day, if you start getting asked questions, it's over. He's, he's dead, he's done. But for you and I, we beg Allah that He gives us what? The easy hisab. So either there are people who will enjoy ar rahman ar rahim or there will be people who get punished through Maliki or Middin. It's one of those two. You see, Allah did not even mention Jahannam. He said, justice is enough. That's enough. That's Maliki or Middin. In these three ayat, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, ar rahman ar rahim Maliki or Middin, is a comprehensive introduction to who Allah is. If somebody asks you who is Allah, these three ayat are enough. Yeah, this is who Allah is. That's enough. That's all you need to know. Allah has given us the most beautiful introduction to Himself in these three ayat. So in our next after five minute session, inshaAllah, I'm going to share with you how the surah proceeds from here after Allah introduces Himself to us. Let's take a good solid five minute break and make some new friends and new enemies. Let's go. We finished Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, and Malik Yamikin. Notice here also there's a balance. And I want to start describing that to you from now. This surah is about balance. So on the one hand you have Allah Azza wa Jal being Rabb, Rabb, and it's balanced with us being what? Alat. On the one hand Allah is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, how is that balanced? Maliki Yawm din If Allah only describes Himself as Maliki Yawm din we become depressed. So He gives us hope first. Then He gives us some fear. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim and then Maliki Yawm din It's also beautiful that when you think of Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, in dunya you think of rizq and guidance and good things. In akhirah you think of Jannah. But on the other end of Jannah is Jahannam. But in the beautiful Fatiha there is no mention of Jahannam, what happened? You're pointing at me. I'm pointing at him. It's really confusing. Okay. Don't point at each other from here. It's really confusing. Okay? Okay. If you want water, just ask. I'll give it to you. Okay. Okay. What was I talking about? Something about Islam? Okay, Jannah and Jahannam. One of the beauties of the Fatiha, it has no mention of Jahannam. It mentions Allah's favor, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Allah's mercy and love, His care and love. And then He mentions Allah's justice. Not punishment, but justice. Those of you that have a little bit of background in philosophy, try to understand this point. Rahma is on the positive side. Adab is on the negative side. Justice is right in the middle, zero. Justice is exactly in the middle. You understand this point? Allah mentioned the positive and then He mentioned justice. He ne never mentioned the negative and that's the, that's the beauty of Fatiha. Allah is teaching us actually by doing so that He will never punish anyone unless it is just. And He will never punish anyone unless they deny the Rahmah of Allah because He started with the positive. Allah says in the Quran, مَا يَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابِكُمْ what is Allah going to get out of punishing you? Why do you think He wants to punish you? He doesn't. So many Muslims think that Allah wants to punish them. It is wrong. Allah does not want to punish anyone. He does not want to punish you. That's in Fatiha itself. Why do you think He started with a Rahman al Rahim like that? You know? Which other Rabb is going to be a Rahman al Rahim? You're not thinking of Rabb al Alameen as a Rahman al Rahim when you start thinking Allah is going to throw me in Jahannam. You should not think like that. It's not a good way to think. But now that you have this beautiful conclusion about who Allah is, then Allah at the end of this, there's a switch that happens and Allah just decides to quote us. These are our words back to Allah. The first part was Allah talking to us. Now we are talking to 
Allah. What we are learning then in the Quran is the Quran is Allah's way of teaching us to have a conversation with Him. The Quran is not just Allah talking to us. The Quran forces us to talk to Allah. Because it is Allah, it is not Allah who is saying, Iyaka na'budu. Who is saying, Iyaka na'budu? You and me, we're saying, Iyaka na'budu. It is you alone that we give ourselves into slavery. We give ourselves into worship. Where we have that conclusion. And it's so beautiful that Allah did not command us and say, Urhudu or Fa'budu. Look at who Allah is. Alhamdulillah. The Hamd belongs to Him. He's the Rabb, He's the Rahman, He's the Rahim, He's Maliki Yawmiddin. Therefore, you must become His Abd. No, no, no. Therefore, I came to my own conclusion, Iyaka Na'budu. If it was a command, that means Allah is forcing you. But Allah has said it in words that are from yourself. You know what that teaches you? Islam is a, 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 a deen that believes in freedom of religion. You have to come to Allah yourself. You cannot be forced to come to Allah. La ikraha fi deen. You have to say yourself, iyaka na'budu. And until you come to that conclusion yourself, not going to be told. You are not going to be forced. It's so incredible that that's just inside iyaka na'budu. And the idea here is if somebody really truly thought about Allah, they would come to this conclusion. And they would just say, I'm ready, Ya Allah, I'm ready to become your slave. I am ready to become your slave. Iyaka na'budu. And why Iyaka? Iyaka actually is called ikhtisas, adatul ikhtisas. I am giving myself in slavery only and only and only to you. We don't say we worship you, we say you, we worship. Is that normal or unusual? And what did I tell you about unusual? Only. That's where the only comes from. It is only you that we give ourselves into worship, into slavery. I want to explain to you now the difference between worship and slavery. Worship and slavery. A lot of times when we talk about ibadah in the Quran, or ubudiyah even in the Quran, na'budu, then we translate that as worship. You understand? But I want to go a step further. I want to say worship and slavery. I give myself in worship and I give myself in slavery. You have to understand the difference between both of them. When do we worship Allah? Five times a day. We worship Allah five times a day. When are we slaves of Allah? All the time. All the time. When you are at Hajj, you are worshiping Allah. But when you are on the plane, you may not be worshiping Allah, you may be sleeping. When you are at work, you may not be worshiping Allah, you may be doing work. But even when you are doing work, you are still a what? Slave. Now the thing, this is very important people, this is very important. If I only made the commitment to worship Allah, if that's all I, my commitment is, I'm just gonna do what? Worship. Then worship is only a few hours, maybe one hour at the most in a day. That's it. 23 hours for me, one hour for Allah. The rest I do whatever I want, but actually, the idea here is that Hudu covers ibadah and ubudiyah, which means I am worshiping Allah and I'm also accepting the fact that I am a slave. I came to that conclusion, I am ready to take you as Rabb and I'm ready to take myself as Abd. Now let's define a slave. A slave is someone who does not do whatever he wants, whatever she wants. A slave is someone who does what the master wants. That is the definition of a slave. What's the definition of a free person? The definition of a free person is, a free person does whatever he wants or she wants. That's a free person. A slave does what the master wants, a free person does whatever he or she wants. Simple definition, isn't it? So when you come before Allah, and you say, I want to give up my will, I, don't, I no longer want to do what I want, I want to do what you want, you tell me, then you realize this is a big job. Then I have to do what Allah wants 24 hours a day. I have to do what Allah wants when I'm working, when I'm driving, when I'm sitting, when I'm standing, how I sleep, how I go to the bathroom, what I eat, how I eat. I have to figure out everything on, from what Allah wants, which means it's a big project. So I say to Allah, I can't do it. It's too much, I need your help. I can't do it on my own. So what do we say? Oh yeah, I can stand. We seek your help. This is too much, Allah. I know I want to be your slave, but that's a big responsibility. I don't think I can do it myself. 
So you, I, I want to be your slave and I need your help. The, the job of a slave is to help the master. In every other relationship, the job of the slave is to help the master. That is why they have slaves, so they can get help. And here Allah wants you to be a slave, and then He says, why don't you ask me for help? <laughs> SubhanAllah. The slavery to Allah cannot be compared to the slavery to anyone else. Because every other master wants help, and this master wants to give you help. It's the opposite. The slavery is forced. This one is what? By choice. Didn't we say, Iya can we do on our own? Didn't we make that choice? No other slave becomes a slave by choice. Nobody walks up to someone and says, hey, put some chains on me, I want to be a slave. Nobody does that. Nobody does that. It is always forced on them. This is the only slavery in existence that is done by choice. And there's a very powerful lesson in that, people. Please listen carefully. Allah Azza wa has created human beings in kabad. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي kabad. And kabad is used for the hard work of a slave. Because a slave has to do work all day. And he can't take a break. Because if he takes a break, the master hits him. So he keeps working. And that is called kabad. It is as though Allah is saying, Allah created human beings in the kind of labor that slaves do. Which means that whether you are slave of Allah or not, you will always be a slave. Maybe you'll be the slave of money. Maybe you'll be a slave of fashion. Maybe you'll be a slave of your culture. Maybe you'll be a slave of your pride. You will always be a slave. But the only way you can be free from all these other slaveries is you become slave of Allah. Otherwise you'll, find you'll always be a slave to something. It will always be there. The human being will never be out of kabad. Something will always get him. SubhanAllah. This is the yaka na'bud wa iyaka nasta'in. We need your help in getting out of the slavery of everything else. There are too many things that keep making me want to become a slave. There are too many things that want to take over my life. I want you to be the one. Iyaka nasta'in. Now here's the other beautiful thing. Two beautiful things. First beautiful thing about iyaka nasta'in. When we seek his help, there are lots of words in Arabic for help. Okay, istimdad is for help, istinsad is for help, isti'ana is for help. There are lots of words, you know. But why isti'ana? Why from the word aun? Aun means help. Let me give you a simple example and move along. Sometimes you're driving and you have a flat tire. Now you need to fix your car. You have a spare tire in the back. You put the jack and you are lifting your car. But you are not strong enough to lift your car. Somebody is walking by and you say, hey, could you help me a little bit? And they help you out. This is called Aoun. Aoun is when you are trying already and then somebody came and what? Helped you. But the condition for Aoun is you were already trying yourself. When we ask Allah for help, Allah taught us the word that says you are already trying yourself and you realize my trying alone is not enough, I have to get Allah's help. I want you to understand the balance here. It's beautiful, it's beautiful. On the one hand, you have people who don't try at all. They don't make any effort. They say, Allah will help me. Why don't you get a job? Well, Allah didn't give me a job yet. Why, why are you so, why don't you exercise? Well, Allah hasn't made me healthy. You don't get to blame Allah for that. You're lazy. And Allah will not help you until you what? Until you try, until you help yourself. That's inside Nasta'een. You have to try yourself, then the help will come. You see, the Sahaba went into Badr. Then the angels came. The angels were not there ahead of time. You've been here since 3 o'clock, where you guys been? It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work. You have to go yourself first, then the help comes. You understand? Ibrahim is thrown in the fire first, then it becomes what? Cool, it wasn't refrigerated ahead of time. It wasn't refrigerated ahead of time. You have to show your part first, then the help of Allah comes. That's nasta'in. So some extremist people say, I don't have to do anything, Allah will do everything. This is wrong, because of iyaqa nasta'in. What's the other extreme? The other extreme is, I can do everything. I don't need Allah. I am so intelligent, this is why I get my promotion. This is why my business is successful. This is why I'm doing so well in everything else. Because I don't need any help. I'm good on my own. I'm so smart. I'm so healthy. I'm so strong. I'm so this. I'm so that. This is the other extreme. 
The slave realizes he can't do anything on his own. So there are two parts to getting things accomplished in life. Your effort and Allah's help. And you are reminded of that every single day when you say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْمُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعْمِدُ You're reminded of that every day, that balance. There are a lot of people who have that misbalance, right? imbalance. The Fatiha addresses some of the most important problems that human beings face until the, the end of time. These problems. Now look at the next problem, إِيَّاكَ نَعْمُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ solves. If I ask you for help, if I ask a young man over here, young man, could you help me? Help. All I say is, help. The young man is confused. Why is he confused? Oh, uh, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to get you some water? Do you want me to buy you some socks? What do you want me to do? I didn't say anything. Now we said we need your help. But did we say we need your help in what? We didn't. We left it. It's open. Why? First of all, you only say help and you don't explain yourself when the one you are talking to already knows. Iyakadastarim means that Allah knows what you need. And Allah knows what you need better than you know. So you don't have to say it, Allah is taking care of it for you. Just say Iyakadastarim. The other thing that's beautiful here is there are so many things you need that the list would be too long, Fatiha would become too long. So just say what? Help. <laughs> just say help. Because the list is too long. So Allah covers everything. It moves me so much. Why is Iyaka Na'budu first and Iyaka Nasta'in second? Why not Iyaka Nasta'in wa Iyaka Na'budu? There are many reasons. I want to give you two of them. Two of them. First reason is, why were human beings created? To do an ibadah or to seek help? To do an ibadah. So your real mission first. Human beings should understand their real mission first. This is a very valuable lesson, people. There are people, Muslims today, there are Muslims today who want Allah's help, but they don't want to do an ibadah. They make dua to Allah for a promotion, for good degrees, for marriage. They go to Allah. They go to Allah when a family member's in the hospital. They, they want isti'ana, but they don't want to do what? They, they, want to, they don't want to be slaves. They don't want to be slaves. They don't want to give up the business that is against Allah's will. They don't want to give up the habits that are against Allah's will. But just give me some dua that I can get whatever I want. I want the iyaka nasta'in part. I don't want the iyaka na'budu part. Allah said, you want my help? You do the first part first. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Very important lesson for Muslims. Now here's the second lesson from iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. It's also beautiful. When we become Allah's slaves, that is for Allah. And only for Allah. When we ask, ask for help, who is that for? Ourselves. So iyaka na'budu is for Allah. And iyaka nasta'in is for ourselves. And what is for Allah should be mentioned first. And what is for you should be mentioned second. And also important because when you do what is for Allah, then automatically Allah will take care of you. It's beautiful. Iyaka This is our relationship with Allah. Now we need Allah's help in lots of things. I want to give you a silly example again so you appreciate this, this lesson of Ihdina Salat al Mustaqim. I gotta keep track of time. Oh my goodness. You guys okay until you go till 11? You guys okay? You all right? Because I want to finish Fatiha at least. At least something about Fatiha. Because the juicy part I leave until the end. I didn't even give you the juicy part yet. <laughs> so, okay. So here's the thing. There's a master and there's a slave. The master comes, says, hey, you, you're my slave. He says, okay. And then they're just standing there. After about an hour, the slave says, so, uh, you, you want to go get some coffee? Or? <laughs> what is the definition of a slave? Do you remember? A, 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 a slave does what? The master wants. But a slave can only do what the master wants if he knows what the master wants. If the slave has no idea, if the master never told him, he has no idea what to do. He's confused. 
I just turned to Allah and you just turned to Allah in the Fatiha and said, Ya Allah, we are slaves. Ready. We signed up. <coughs> now that we signed up, what do we need? Instructions. If Allah doesn't give me instructions, what's the point of calling you a slave? You don't even know what your master wants. That actually means you're still free. Because you're still doing what you want. So you need some instructions. And when instructions come from Allah, they are called Buddha. When instructions come from Allah, they are called Buddha. So Allah says, he teaches us to say, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guidance. We ask for guidance. I want you to understand the relationship between guidance, slave, and slavery. A slave until he has guidance from the master. Because without guidance, he doesn't know what to do. Which would de defy the definition itself. So to be a, a, a abd necessarily means to seek hidayah, to seek guidance. These two things are inseparable, which is why in the Quran, over and over and over and over again, Allah mentions Rabb, Allah mentions Huda. Allah mentions Rabb, Allah mentions Huda. Over and over again. Sabbi hisma Rabbika al-A'la, Sabbi hisma Rabbika, Rabbika al-A'la, alladhi khalaqa fasawa, alladhi qaddara fa hada. Asa an yahdiyani Rabbi sawa as-sabi. Yahdiyani Rabbi. وَقُلْ عَسَىٰ أَنْ يَهْدِيَنِي رَبِّي لِأَقْرَبَ مِنْ هَذَا رَشَدًا يَهْدِيَنِي رَبِّي لِأَقْرَبَ مِنْ هَذَا رَشَدًا Hidayah, guidance and love. Guidance and love. Over and over again. كَلَّا إِنَّ مَعْيَا رَبِّي سَيَهْدِيمِ My Rabb is with me, He will guide me. Rabb and guidance are inseparable in the Qur'an. And I hope you understand the relationship now between these two things. So we ask Allah to guide us. إِذِنَا Guide us. But guidance to what? He says, as sirat al-mustaqeem. But he didn't say, ihdina ila sirat al-mustaqeem. Or ihdina lis sirat al-mustaqeem. Or ihdina bis sirat al-mustaqeem. He said, ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Actually, in the Quran, I know not a lot of you know Arabic, and that's okay. Sometimes you say, in English, we say, guide us to the straight path. You notice the word to? To the straight path. In the Arabic, you can say, ila. You can say, li. And you can say guide us using the straight path in dina bis sirat al mustaqim but none of them are there. None of those words are there. It is just directly in dina as sirat al mustaqim So what, what does that mean? Pay, pay attention to this part, it's very powerful. If I want to go back to my hotel, I ask one of you, how do I get there? And you can go over here, go over there, you go over there, and jump in the water. And then, you know, you give me directions. Now you guided me, you gave me directions, but did you come with me or I'm on my own? I'm on my own. Because I have your directions, I wrote them down, that's good enough. That's good enough. When you give directions to a destination, that is called ila. I got you to it. When you hold someone's hand and you take them all the way to their hotel, then you use lam, hadaytuka li. Lam. We say, alhamdulillahi alladhi hadana. Ila hada or li hada? Li hada. Allamu lil ghaya. We say in Arabic. You know what that means? That means we get to Jannah and we say, alhamdulillah, the one who guided us all the way to this. In other words, he was with us the entire time. He didn't just say, take a right here, take a left there, you get there. No, 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 no. He was with us the entire time. His ma'iya was with us, and he took us all the way to Jannah. So lam is used when you get to your destination. Ila is used when you just get the directions. Ba is used when you tell someone, use this car to go. Use this and use that to go. Allah used none of these in Ihdina Salat al -Mustaqim. Why? Because when you use none of them, it actually means you are using all of them at the same time. The principle of Arabic is if you use none of them, then actually you are using all of them because you cannot use all of them together. So if you want to use all of them together, you use none of them. That's the principle. So every one of them can be implied. So then we are learning three things about guidance. I want you to understand what these three things are. Number one, we are asking Allah for directions. You can call it an easy Arabic, easy English. We are asking Allah for knowledge. 
We're asking Allah for knowledge, but knowledge is not enough. Second, we're asking Allah's company. We don't want to go on the straight path by ourselves, we want to go on the straight path while Allah is supporting us. So He never hangs up on the phone, He's always with. You understand? That's the second. Then the third, we are saying that this path itself should make it easy to take the next step. Ya Allah, guide me using the straight path. That you know like a car, you use a car to go on the road, the car helps you travel. Allah is teaching us in this ayah, the road itself will help you. The road itself will push you. You know like a, one of those conveyor belt things where you stand and it's moving on its own? It will keep pushing you. If you're on it, it will keep making you get progress. Make progress on its own. So all three meanings of Indira Salat al How is it translated as Salat? How is it Salat? Anybody know? Path. Path. But you know in Arabic a Salat can only be used for a straight path. If a road is like this, you can't call it Salat. If a road is like that, you can't call it Salat. You can only call it Salat if it is straight. But if it means straight, then why did Allah say a Salat what? And mustaqim to the mustaqim means straight. A sirat is already straight. If you say something to somebody, even a sirat, that means guidance to the straight path already. Then why add al mustaqim? Because al mustaqim is not just straight, it is straight up. Al mustaqim does not mean straight, it means what? Straight up. Because it comes from qama or istaqama to stand up. Not to go forward, but to go up. From qiyam. Qiyam means what? Standing. Allah talks about the, the, the shopkeeper who have, you know, the old times where you see some of the street markets over here, they have the weighing machine and they hold it in their hand and there's oranges on this side and there's the weight on that side, but the guy has to hold it what? Don't hold it like this and cheat your customer. Hold it straight, you understand? But it's straight lying down or up? It's straight up. I am asking Allah for guidance on a path that heads which way? <laughs> Straight up. That means this path, the, lo the longer I travel it, the further I get from dunya. Is that true? And the higher my level becomes, the higher my rank becomes, the closer I get to higher and higher and higher levels. Isn't that true? And by the way, the higher you are, the more danger you're in. If you're only one foot high and you fall, you're okay. If you're 20 feet high and you fall, you're not so okay. If you're 100 feet high, and then Allahi wa Allahi you understand? In other words, the person who is traveling on this road for a long time is in less danger or more danger? They're in more danger. Sometimes people wonder, why are these ulama crying all the time? Why is the Shaykh crying? He's such a good guy, he's always in the masjid. He's always reciting Quran. He never watches movies, he doesn't do the things I do. Why is he crying all the time? I should be crying. You don't realize, the higher you go, the scarier it gets. So they realize that, so they cry more. Because it's scary up there. And is it, and is it guaranteed, guaranteed that you will not fall? fall? Is there a guaranteed? guarantee? No. no. So we so say to Allah, guide, guide, guide us to the straight path that shoots, shoots up. Sirat is also used for a wide road, road so, multiple so multiple people can, people can get, on get on this at the same, same time. time. You don't have, you don't to, have push to push someone, someone else, else to make, to make, to make room for yourself. Hey, try hey, and get to Jannah, you. You don't have you to don't do, that. do that. Subhanallah. So now so we're now heading, heading up this path. path. But you know but the you know higher you go, the more difficult it gets. The more difficult it gets. And Allah says to us, that whoever Allah decides, decides to die, to die yes, 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 he, will he will open, open his chest, chest for Islam. Islam. He will make he will him calm. calm. He won't be he won't nervous, be nervous anymore. anymore. And so and when so you're when going, you're going up, up this path, path, you need, you need help. some help. And the help will come in Salat al Nadi 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 some wonderful questions by the way I really appreciate the questions very good 
Uh, in our next break, I'm going to go that side to the guys over there in the middle. So they don't get a chance. Inshallah. Is that fireworks? I thought you locked someone in that door and he's really angry. <laughs> Hey, while, while, while he's setting up the recording, I'll tell you a funny story. So I went to Dubai for the peace conference and I was having lunch with uh, Dr. Zakir Naik at a restaurant. And we're both, you know, we're having lunch talking and two brothers see us from a distance. They're like, oh! And they come running over. And they say, Salaamu Alaikum to Dr. Zakir Naik. How are you, Shaykh? How are you? It's so wonderful to see you. And then they turn to me and say, hey, man, can you take a picture for us? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> so, I said, okay. So I took a picture for them. <laughs> that was awesome. Anyway, anyway, where were we? Before the fireworks. How far did we get? Ehdina Sirat al Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim is describing the road itself. It is heading upwards. It is a difficult journey. And I told you it leads away from dunya. Now, what does that mean? I need the Muslims to understand, myself to understand, you to understand what does it mean to leave dunya. It does not mean to not do hard work and not succeed and not have the most successful organizations and businesses and governments and cities and economies in the world. It does not mean any of that. What it means is dunya is in your hands and it's not in your heart. Dunya is in your hands and not in your heart. Allah did not want us to abandon dunya. He does not want us to not build this world and not make better countries and better cities and better economies and get better jobs. That is not true. Allah says, وَاسْتَعْمَرَكُمْ فِيهَا He wanted you to build this world. He wanted you to establish and build and develop. He wants that for, for this earth. But He just doesn't want you to think that this is the final home. He wants you to work and succeed in this world but understand that true success is in the Akhirah. And you're above it all the time. You know, there are people who only live for this dunya. They only live for one promotion, next promotion, next promotion. More money, then more money, then more money, then more money. Their entire life becomes about money. And they used to work 40 hours in a week to earn money. Now they make 50 times more money and they work 100 hours a week. And they used to think to themselves, when I make more money, I'll have a break. But what happened? When they made more money, now they have no break. It's, come, it's more work than ever before. This is not what Allah wants from you. This is not what Allah wants from you. You, are, you can enjoy this dunya. He put things in this world for you so you can enjoy your life. Live well. He said that himself. But, if you forget why you're really here, he gave you these luxuries, these amenities, so that you have a convenient life, so you have no excuse not to worship Him. Not to be excellent towards Him. This is what it means to rise above dunya. The dunya is not something you're hung up on. If it's there, alhamdulillah. If it's not there, alhamdulillah. You're okay either way. You understand? So now this is the idea of Salat al The next challenge, wow. <laughs> How long does it last? <laughs> 15 minutes? MashaAllah, I'm not in that Alright, sorry. Sirat al This ayah is actually about not the road, but the people on the road. It's not about the road, it is about the people on the road. And here again, I want you to listen carefully to a silly example. If you go to a college, a university, and you're studying engineering, do you get advice from the student who is in the same class as you? Or do you get advice from the student who already graduated and has a job? You get advice from the one who already graduated. The guy who's sitting next to you in class knows as much as you. You don't know, he doesn't know what's right and wrong. The guy who already finished college, he already got a job, he already knows what the economy is like, what this major is like, which courses are the most important. That's the guy who already finished. This is why the ayah says, Ya Allah, show me the path of those and the one you 
facilitate it, you made ease for it, you gave chef favor to it, you showered with luxury and ease and relaxation. This is important to mention because all of it is mentioned in the past tense. An'amta alayhim al-fi'l al Not sirat al-ladhina tul'imu alayhim. No, no, no. Not the path of those who you favor. No, the path of those who you favored. Because we don't want to know from current students, we want to know from the graduates. When we ask Allah for this, then we know that our role models, the people we look up to, the people we trust and we rely on, they are not the people who are necessarily alive now. Who are they? Our real heroes? The people of the past. And the greatest heroes? The ones that Allah made a part of His book. They were so wonderful that Allah made them a part of His Qur'an so He can guide you and me. So every story of the Prophet, every mention of good people in the Qur'an, every legacy of the past that Allah describes in the Qur'an is an answer to a dua, Sirat al-Ladina al-Amta It's the answer to that dua. I didn't get to tell you about the emotion of Edina. I should tell you that briefly. So I asked for some water. What? But I wasn't dying. That was okay. If they bring me water, good. If they don't bring me water, I'll keep talking, no problem. <coughs> but if I was dying of thirst, would I ask differently? Right now, say, hey, can you give me some water? That's fine. If I was dying of thirst, I would take this thing off. Please, give me some water. I would be desperate. If you really, really, really need something, then you become desperate. If you don't really need something, you ask for it, but you're like, mm, what? Now when you recite Fatiha, and I recite Fatiha, and we get to إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ How do we ask? If you get time, you know. Or do we ask like we're desperate, like we're dying, like we can't do without it, like we absolutely need it. And by the way, by the way, Allah said, we ask ourselves, show us the path of those who you favor. And where do we get the answer to that? In the other surahs of the Quran. Which means by reciting Fatiha, you are asking Allah, Ya Allah, give me the answer. And He gave you the answer in the rest of the Quran. So you, your dua has already been answered in the fact that the Quran was revealed. Which means if you don't, if you don't recite the Quran, you don't really mean what you're saying in the Fatiha. You asked Allah and He gave and you don't take advantage of it. You asked for water and the water was provided and now you're not drinking it. What's your problem? Now you only have yourself to blame. Nobody else. This is Ayyidina Salat al-Mustaqeem, Salat al-Ladina an'amta alayhim. And even in the words an'amta alayhim, it's so beautiful that Allah mentioned Himself, right? He said, you made it easy for them. You made luxury for them. And anta comes from the word nu'uma. Nu'uma in Arabic means softness and ease. That is why cows are called an'am. Cattle are called an'am. Why? Because they move how? Softly. They're slow. They're not like a cat that moves fast. You know, or a lion that moves fast. An'am, they're, they're chilling out. They're just hanging out, taking it easy. And Allah is describing to us that there are people of the past, Allah made ease for them. Ya Allah, put me on the same path of those who you made ease for. Because they could not have done it themselves. You must have made things easy for them. So if you put me on that path, that means I cannot do this myself, you will make things easy for me too. That's the idea of an amta ali. Now in this, as we switch over to the last part, when we go to this part, is really interesting. Is used it comes from the ghayr, it means different. And ghayr means I want to be nothing like these people. Whoever is about to be described, I want to be nothing like them. Al Mahdubi alayhim. Few things I want you to know about them. The first thing is, how is it translated? Al Mahdubi alayhim. How is it translated? You know. Not of those who... Anybody heard of it? Not of those who earned your anger. <coughs> You've heard that before? Or heard... Or not of those who earned your wrath. The problem is, the word your is not there. The word your, when we translate, not of those who earned your anger. And what do we mean by your anger? Whose anger? Allah's anger. Allah is not mentioned. 
Allah does not say in the ayah any mention of Himself. It just says al maghdubi alayhim, those who were recipients, those who received anger, those who received wrath. That's what's mentioned. The other interesting thing here is, when you look for role models, and you look for good examples, do you look in the present or the past? You look in the past, because the past tense was used. But when Allah talks about the people who receive wrath, who receive rage, Allah used a noun. Oh my God, what's a noun? It's permanent, isn't it? Which means you will find the people who receive anger in the past, you will also find them in the present, and you will also find them in the future, and you might become one of them. So you have to ask Allah, Ya Allah, I don't make me from them, because I know they're always there, and I might become from them. You cannot ask Allah without knowing that you might be in danger of becoming them. <coughs> if you're not in danger, you wouldn't ask. You wouldn't ask. So we are in danger of becoming what? Al What else are we in danger of becoming? Let's let me describe al Mahdub a little more to you. A few more things you have to understand about al Mahdub alayhim. When I say I am angry with you, who's angry? I am angry. If I say I helped you, who helped? I did. When I say you were helped, you were helped. Who helped you? Do you know who? No. The word maghdub is passive. What that means is they are receiving wrath. They are receiving wrath, but Allah does not say what? Who's anger? Who's wrath? Who's angry at them? Allah did not mention. Why is that? There are a couple of reasons. Reason number one, there are too many of them. Allah is angry at them. The angels are angry at them. Their own followers are angry at them. Their families are angry at them. The believers are angry at them. The disbelievers in Judgment Day are angry at them. The people in Jahannam who are already there are angry at the people who are coming in. La marhaban bihim. There's anger, 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 anger. Ya Allah, don't make me from the people who they get anger from every side. They get it from you and they get it from all of your creation. Those are people Allah cursed and Allah created angels only for the job of cursing them. It's not limited. The other amazing thing here is Allah is so angry with them, He doesn't even mention the extent of Allah's anger with them. They receive rage. Then the last one is the lost. I don't say those who were misguided. That's incorrect. The lost. The lost. And I want you to understand the difference between the, the those who receive anger and the lost. What is the practical difference? I don't want to give you a complex explanation. This session tonight is to give you an easy explanation, inshallah. Something you can remember. So I have two sons, Walid and Imad. Imad is older, Walid is younger. I go outside for five minutes. Son, I'm going to fix my car. I'll be back in five minutes. There is some chocolate on the table. Don't eat it. I tell Imad, don't eat the chocolate. Walid is upstairs. Walid didn't hear me. Five minutes later, I come back. Imad and Walid are sitting together on the couch. And what's happening? They're both eating chocolate. Who should I be angry at? Should I be angry at Imad, who I told? Or should I be angry at Walid? I tell Imad, he says, oh yeah, sorry. Didn't you know? Yes, I knew. Didn't I tell you? Yes, you told me. Why did you eat it then? Well, I, I don't know, it's really delicious. <laughs> and then Walid says, I had no idea, I was confused. <laughs> What I'm trying to tell you is, al maqdub alayhim are people who do the wrong thing even when they know. Someone who knows and still does the wrong thing, it is logical that you would be angry at them. If, I am, if I'm a teacher and I give you the exam, the day before, here's the exam, here's the answer key. Please get a hundred tomorrow. And you still fail the exam, then wallahi, I mean, come on. 
I'm going to be angry. But if a student who never came to class has missed all the lessons, he takes the exam and he gets a zero, he can say, I was lost. Confused, you understand? There's a difference between the one who gets anger and the one who is lost. The one who gets anger has knowledge. The one who has lost, is lost has no knowledge. That's why he's lost. If you knew where to go, you would not be lost. You understand? So now on the one hand, we are asking Allah, Ya Allah, give us knowledge, but make sure that we don't become the people who have knowledge and they still don't act. And on the other hand, we're asking Allah, Ya Allah, don't make us people that are ignorant who have no knowledge. So we ask for action in al mahdubi alayhim and we ask for knowledge in al It's beautiful. Our entire religion is knowledge and action. That's all it is, our entire religion. And that's in al mahdubi alayhim wal al You understand these two things now? Now, I want to take you back to the Tabal and we'll show you some things. Please, I know it's hot. It's long night, it's very hot. I don't know, maybe it's not hot for you people. Is it hot for you people? Are you used to this already? I don't know. Maybe I'm just I'm melting because I'm from the United States or something. But no, I think it's not for all of us. But I, I, I'm, I'm begging you, just pay extra attention to this part. You'll, you'll appreciate it. You will appreciate it. I told you this surah is a surah of balance. This is a surah of balance. I want to show you lots of ways in which this is a surah of balance. Let's begin. The first part of this surah, Allah Azza wa Jalla described it was about Himself. It's about Allah. The first part of the surah is about Allah. The which part? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Maliki, Ar Rahim. That part is about Allah. The last part of the surah is about us. Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim, Sirat al Ladi La Nabi Alayhim, Ghair Nabi Alayhim, Ar Rahim. All of it is what about? We are asking Allah. We are asking Allah. In the first part, Allah is talking to us. In the last part, we are talking to Allah. Okay. In the first part, Allah is telling us what He wants us to know. In the last part, we are asking Allah what we need from Him. You understand? But what about the middle? The middle, the first part is for Allah, and the last part is for yourself. You see how it's balanced? Part one is about Allah. Part three is about us. The middle part, is about Allah and us. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And the hadith says, the hadith Qudsi says about that ayah, This is between me and my slave. It's right in between. That's the first balance. The second balance I want to share with you is there's a balance between the Rahmah of Allah, the loving care of Allah, and the justice of Allah, those two are balanced. The third balance I just told you about recently was you ask Allah, but you also make the... You ask Allah for help, but you also make the effort yourself. You have to have both. Those are balanced inside the word. Iyaka nasta'in. You remember that balance? That's another example of balance. Then you have towards the end, two kinds of, Allah actually asked us, He literally told us to walk on the straight path, which is an example of balance itself. A, ba a path cannot be straight up until it is perfectly balanced. When you want to put the beam up in a building and it's mustaqim, that means it's perfectly straight, perfectly balanced. Do you understand? So even the imagery is that of balance. Now things get complicated. Pay attention. There are two kinds of sentences in Arabic. Noun sentences and verb sentences. I'll say that again. Two kinds of sentences. You tell me now. Noun sentences and verb sentences. Noun sentences describe something more permanent. Verb sentences describe something more temporary. Okay. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawm Al-Din is a noun sentence. That is a noun sentence. All of it is a verb sentence. So part one is noun, part three is what? Verb. What about the middle part? The middle part is verb, but it still begins with a 
noun, which means it's a mixture of both. Iyaka is a noun, even though the central verb is na'budu. So what I'm trying to tell you is the first part linguistically is a noun sentence, the last part is a verb sentence, and the middle part is a mixed sentence. Now what do you know about nouns? Permanent or temporary? Permanent. The noun sentences were section what? One, two, or three? One. And section one is about who? Allah. So it's only appropriate that the noun sentences be used because Allah is permanent. The last sentence, the last section is what kind of sentence? Verb sentence. And verbs are what? Temporary. It is only appropriate that verbs be used for human beings because human beings are temporary. The middle ayah is an agreement between us and Allah. Part of it is for Allah, part of it is for ourselves. It is only perfect that it should be a mixture of noun and verb sentence. <laughs> Linguistically, it is a marvel. It is incredible. Human beings can't speak like this. It's impossible. Nominal sentences, verb, verbal sentences, jumla ismiya, jumla fi'liya, and then a mixture of both of them. Is, I studied that for the first time, I said, forget it. This is. Come on. That's, who says this is not the word of Allah? <laughs> like, what dumb can you get? You know? Now let's go even a step further. I want to show you another balance. It's beautiful. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Maliki, Yawmiddin. All of that is knowledge. Knowledge about who? Knowledge about Allah. Part 1, section 1 is what? Knowledge. We are enslaving ourselves to you. We are asking for your help. These are what? Actions. We, we went from knowledge to what? Actions. So the part one is knowledge, part two is what? Action. The question is what kind of action? We ask Allah, We want the straight path. We want the straight path. Now what is the straight path? The straight path is the path when you have knowledge and you have action, that's the straight path. What if you're missing one of them? What if you're missing action? You only have knowledge, what do you have? Who is that? If you have knowledge but you have no action, what is the word for that in the Fatiha? No, in the Fatiha. al maghubi alayhim has knowledge but no action. What if you have action, but you have no knowledge? What is that called? Bali. Now look at this. The surah began with knowledge. Then it went to action. Then the ayah, we ask Allah to give us the balance between knowledge and action. as mustaqim. Then we ask Allah, don't make us from people who have knowledge, but no action. And don't make us from people who have action, but no knowledge. The whole surah is a balance between knowledge and action. Now let's go back again. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Maliki, Yawmiddin. The hamd of Allah, the praise of Allah, the relationship with Allah, all of it is actually supposed to be entirely personal. It's supposed to be personal. Hamd is an emotion. Remember, remember that? It's an emotion. And emotions are felt individually. A thousand people are making salat at the same time, but no two people feel the same way. Isn't that true? My emotions are my emotions, your emotions are your emotions. The first part of the surah is personal. Then we say, Iyaka <coughs> na'budu, not a'budu. Iyaka na'budu. We go from personal to we worship, we enslave. We go to what? A group. A group. This entire religion is a balance between being a slave of Allah by yourself and being a slave of Allah with your community. And Fatiha is a balance between individual, personal, and collective. They're both balanced. One balance, after another, after another, after another. I'll show you another really cool balance. You can, you can say, The wow is the middle letter. So on the one hand you have, On the other hand you have, Now watch this. Alhamdulillah is enough reason to become Allah's slave. When somebody realizes Alhamdulillah, they want to become Allah's slave. When they realize Allah is Rabbil Alameen, they want to become Allah's slave. When they realize Allah is Ar-Rahman, they want to become Allah's slave. When they realize He's Ar-Rahim, they become Allah's slave. When they realize He's Maliki Al-Madin, they become Allah's slave. 
So when we say iyaka na'budu, it is the conclusion of the first part. The conclusion of part one is iyaka na'budu. If you truly understand Allah, you will come, what will come out of your mouth? Iyaka na'budu. The last part begins with, we seek your help. What's the ultimate help? Allah's guidance. So the introduction to the part, part two is iyaka nasta'in. We ask Allah's help, and then the first help we ask is His guidance, and we elaborate what that help is going to look like. And the chapter, the heading of that is, we're asking your help, and here's how we're asking. إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِينَ In other words, the conclusion to the first part is in the first part of the middle ayah. And the introduction to the last part is in the latter half of the middle ayah. It is perfectly balanced. It's perfectly balanced. And I tell you, the entire Qur'an is perfectly balanced. The entire Qur'an. Last surah of the Qur'an, what is it? In the Mus'haf. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِي رَبِّ النَّاسِ Here you have Rabbil Alameen, there you have Rabbil Nas. Here you have Malikil Nas. Here you have what? Maliki Yawm al-Din. There you have Ilahi Nas. Ilah is someone you worship. Here you have Iyaka Na'budu. Here you have غَيْنِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَبْضَالِينَ Are these individuals or entire nations? الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَبْضَالِينَ They are entire nations. So we are asking for protection from social fitna. Fitna of groups, fitna of nations. In, in, in Surah Al-Nas, we say, مِنْ شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِنْ خَلْنَاسِ الَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُ فِي سُقُورِ النَّاسِ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ The individual evil. There is social evil in Fatiha. We ask Allah to protect us from it. And there is individual evil of the waswasa of shaitan that comes to each of you individually. It is not a cultural attack. It's not an economic attack. It's not a social attack. It's an individual attack. The collective is in the Fatiha. The individual is in Surah Al-Nas. Amazing. The entire Quran is balanced. The entire Quran is balanced. One last thing. I promise. I promise. We asked Allah Azza wa Jal, and this is maybe one of the most important lessons for the Muslim world in particular. I wish we paid more attention to the Quran. I really do. Rasul Sallallahu says that you can think of al-maqdub alayhim as who? Who can be the al-maqdub alayhim? The Jews. And who are going to be the Dalim? The Christians. So maybe you have a Jewish neighbor, or you have a Christian neighbor. You say, hey, my Dalim friend over there, <laughs> he was saying hello the other day. You know, my professor Mahdub Ali him. Let me tell you something. If Allah wanted to say, Ya Allah, guide me to the straight path and don't make me Jewish and don't make me Christian, then he would have said that. Then he would have said that. He didn't say that. What did he say? Al Mahdub Ali him and Mubad. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained what Allah said. But how do you understand the explanation is the problem. I told you that al maghdubi alayhim is when you have one thing and one thing is missing. What do you have and what is missing? You remember? You have knowledge but action is missing. What does Allah tell us about Jews in the Quran? They had a lot of knowledge but action was missing. What does Allah tell us about Christians in the Quran? They had a lot of worship and actions, but they had no what? Even basic knowledge. They didn't have the knowledge. Rasul is giving us what you can call a case study. If you want to understand al maghdub alayhim, look at the example of who in the Quran? The Jews. If you want to look at a case study of Adali, of, of look at the example of, of Christians where? In the Quran. Allah is not talking about the Jew and the Christian right now. He's talking about the Jews and Christians mentioned in the Quran. Because Allah specifically talks about how they had knowledge and they didn't act. Or they had no knowledge and they acted without knowledge. In other words, this is a case study. This is not about all Jews and all Christians. Because there are many Jews who became Muslim. There are many Christians who become Muslim even today. They are not considered a Ba'li, you understand? We, have, we oversimplify this matter and judge people based on it. It's incorrect. And by the way, Allah made it open and He asked me 
he asked, he told me, he taught me and you to ask Allah, Ya Allah, I don't want to become a maghdub alayhim. I don't want to become a dhalli. None of us can convert to Judaism anyway. Even if you wanted to, they don't let you. You have to pay a very high fee. <laughs> well, you can't convert. Most of us, you know, there's efforts being made to convert Muslims to Christianity and may Allah protect the Islam of the Muslims everywhere. But, you know, seriously, I mean, Tawheed is too powerful. It's, you have to do a lot of circus tricks to get to Christianity. We're not a real, it's not a real threat, you understand? The only, the only time Christianity becomes a threat is when the Muslims are ignorant. When the Muslims know their deen, it's not a threat. But then why am I asking Allah to not make me from Maghdub alayhi wa al-Dhalim? I'm asking, and why did Allah give me so many examples of Jews and Christians in the Qur'an? Why did He give me those examples? He gave me those examples so I can learn. I better not have knowledge and still know action. And I better not care about knowledge and do whatever I want. Because if I don't care about knowledge and do whatever I want, I am from the Dhabi. And if I have knowledge and I don't act on it, I'm from Maghdur alayhim. I don't want to be from those people. I don't want to be like al Yahud wa Nasara that are mentioned in the Quran. If we were not in that danger, we wouldn't be asking Allah to protect us from it. So when you think of al Mahdub alayhim and al-Dalim, don't think of Jews and Christians first. Think of who first? Ourselves. And don't think of the Jews and the Christians, rather think of the example of the Jews and the Christians as mentioned in the Quran. What does Allah say about the Jews? What does Allah say about the Christians? And am I doing the same thing? When the Jews are asking, what color cow? Fat or skinny? You know, young or old? What, what, what kind of cow? Should we get like, you know, organic or... Where do you want us to get it from? You know, where do you want to get it, get it from? And when we start asking these kinds of questions about our deen, and we disobey Allah in big things, we have no problem with riba, we have no problem with alcohol, we have no problem with cheating and stealing and bribes, no problem. But we have lots of questions about 8 taraweeh or 20 taraweeh. And there's a problem. Then this is just like launul baqar. This is just like that, you're asking the wrong questions. There's a bigger problem to solve. There's disobedience to Allah being done in big things. And you're worried about things that, you know, they're either way you're okay. <laughs> either way you're not in trouble. You know? So we, ha we have to seriously ask Allah, <laughs> Now I shared all of this with you, because wallahi, I feel personally, and oh, by the way, the volunteers, you can start passing out those cards inshallah. I feel personally, Fatiha is one of the most beautiful expressions of wonder in the Qur'an. I didn't even share with you the other kinds of balance that are inside the Fatiha. Like the balance between human beings. The balance between human beings. If you let human beings judge, if you let men and women judge, if you make a woman the judge for all the cases, divorce cases, who is she going to favor? Women. If you make a man the judge for all the divorce cases, who is he going to favor? Men. Especially if he had a divorce, forget it. That woman's going to jail or something, you know? If you let the government decide everything, the people will suffer. If you let the people decide everything, the government will suffer. There'll be chaos. If you let the boss decide everything, the employee will suffer. If you let the employee decide everything, the boss will suffer. Isn't that true? Human beings also always have conflict. And there's no one party, no one party that can say, I am equally favoring you, and I am equally favoring you. You can't do it, you can't find it. Because at the end of the day, a human being will either be a man or a woman. Which means he can only think like a man or only think like a woman. A representative in the court will either represent the government or represent the people. You can't be both. You can either represent the owner, the boss, or you can represent the employee. You can't be both. Allah says, إِهْدِنَسْ We say to Allah, إِهْدِنَسْ صِلَاتَ الْمُسْتَقِينَ Because this is the only path, the only path that Allah gives. Because Allah is the math, the owner of the man and the woman, the boss and the employee, the government and the people, the only one who can truly give justice. The surah is about finding justice on this earth. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. So my intention, inshaAllah ta'ala, is to share just the, what makes the Qur'an beautiful. Just what makes it beautiful and what makes it relevant to my life and yours. Hopefully after tonight, the way you read Fatiha is different. The way you understand Rabbil Alameen is different. The way you understand Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim is different. 
I try not to give you, even though I try, I get technical sometimes, my attempt is to not make things too technical. My attempt is to try to simplify things so it can be a practical relationship with the Qur'an. Just a practical relationship every Muslim needs. And those of you that are talab al and you want to study more advanced things, congratulations to you. But for the rest of us, for most of us, we need something simple, straightforward, that we can benefit from immediately. That is my intention. And as part of that intention, what I've tried to do, some of you know about it already, I did a video explanation of the entire Qur'an. It's called cover to cover. I did the whole thing. Alhamdulillah, it's done. And it is posted on bayina.tv. And I would like, before Ramadan begins, for each of you to subscribe to bayina.tv. Now there's two ways you can subscribe. If you can afford to do so, you can purchase a subscription. If you cannot afford to do so, you can get it for free. It's fine. I don't care. Just get it. If you can't afford it, just go bayina.tv, click on gift, and get it. Why am I asking you to get it? Because I'm doing all this hard work. Because I know in my family, we didn't have an easy explanation of the Qur'an. And when I tried to read a tafsir, and when my father tried to read it, and my sister tried to read it, it was difficult to understand. It's difficult. We need something that's easy to understand. Practical. How do I benefit from this? How is this helping me? That's the attempt. It's not perfect. No, no effort from human beings will be perfect. But at least it's, it's hope that you can begin to build a relationship with the Qur'an. I don't want you to listen to the whole thing, by the way. It's 300 something hours. It's very long. But if you listen like 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day, just night before you go to sleep, listen to something from the Qur'an. Over time, the first of the rain is just a drop, then it pours, it floods. Knowledge will build. Your relationship with the Qur'an will build. Let's make this Ramadan not only about reciting the Qur'an, this way inshallah you can make this Ramadan about understanding the Qur'an too. Living the Qur'an a little bit too. Developing a little bit more of a relationship with the Qur'an too. This weekend seminar, those of you that are attending, I know it's filled up and it's, a lot of you are disappointed that you can't make it. But Alhamdulillah it is being recorded. And the entire recording we're going to put up on bayina.tv too. Inshallah ta'ala. I want to give you a glimpse of what I'm going to talk about and I'm done for the evening. Okay, I'll just give you a little picture of what I'm going to talk about in this program. Let me give you one example. Which example can I give you? Okay, I'll give you the example of Isa Ali. This weekend, all I'm going to talk about is how perfect the Quran is. How beautiful the Quran is. How incredible the Quran is. I'll give you one example. Small example. Isa Ali in Surah Maryam, he's just one day old. He's a one day old baby. And he says, he speaks to the people, he says, وَأَوْصَانِي بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ مَا دُمْتُ حَيَّةِ وَبَرًّا بِوَالِدَتِي وَلَمَّ كُنْ جَبَّارَ الْعَصِيَّةِ He says, Allah gave me the advice, Allah counseled me to salah and zakah. So long as I am alive. Listen carefully. Allah told him to do what? Salah and zakah so long as he is alive. Then he says, وَبَرًّا بِوَالِدَتِي And Allah told me to be good to my mother. And he didn't make me tough. He didn't make me harsh. So there are actually four commands, or three commands. He commanded him to salat and zakat, prayer and zakat, so long as he's alive. And then he commanded him to be good to his mother. Now, the first part. The advice, the word for advice in the ayah is awsa. Wa awsa ni bi salati. Awsa. The Quran uses awsa, and the Quran also uses wasa. It uses awsa and it uses wasa. They both mean to give advice, to give counsel. Awsa and wasa are also used when you leave a will. You know, when you're dying and you leave a will, the house goes to this, the car goes to that. That's also called awsa. Or, awsa, or what's the other word? Wasa. They're both used like that. Now the Qur'an uses both of these words. But it's very interesting. I want you to understand the difference between awsa and wasa. Then you'll appreciate something about this ayah. Awsa is when you give advice one time. Awsa is when you give advice when? One time. Wasa is when you give advice over and over and over. Awsa is what? Tell me. One time. Wasa is what? Over and over again. Okay. 
Now, in the Quran, Awsa and Wasa are used very interesting. Every time Allah talks about inheritance and somebody dying in a will, He uses Awsa. Every time He uses which one? Awsa, which makes sense. You know why? Because a will is discussed how many times? One time at the time of death. That's it, it's done. It's done. It's written one time and it's stored. Every time Allah talks about the advice for salah and taqwa and zakah and, and, and uh, you know, iman, then He doesn't say awsa, He says what? Wasa. Why does that make sense? Because the advice to pray and the advice to remember Allah and the advice to worship Allah, should you give that advice one time or over and over again? You should give it over and over again. So once again, awsa is used for one time and in the Quran it's used for the will. Wasa is used for what? Over and over again, and it's used for deen. Deen. Now come to the ayah again. Wa awsani bi salati wa zakati ma dumtu hayya. Isa alayhi salam is the only example in the Quran Allah used awsa for advice. What, what was the advice Allah gave him? Salat and zakat. Every other time when it's advice about deen, Allah does not use awsa, He uses what? Wasa. Do you remember the difference between Awsa and Wasa? What was the difference? Awsa is once, Wasa is over and over again. How old is Isa? One day old. He can't get advice over and over again yet. Allah just gave him advice that one time. So Allah used Awsa. <laughs> you see that? It's so perfect. Wasa wouldn't make sense. Kaifa Wasa. Wasa means gave advice for months and years. <laughs> He's one day old, he can't get advice for once in years. He can only use Awsa. Because it's one time. Now look at this. Allah says, about Isa says, Allah told me, He gave me the advice to three things. You remember the three things? What were the three things? Salat, Zakat, and good to my mother. But there's a difference, there's interesting. He says, Allah gave me advice for Salat and Zakat so long as I am alive. And then he said, and to be good to my mother. So he didn't say, Allah told me to do salah and zakah and to be good to my mother so long as I'm alive. He separated the mother part. He separated it. Which is amazing. Because Isa alayhi salam will not die until much later. And when he comes back thousands of years later, is his mother still there? No, but does he still have to make Salat and Zakat? So he says, Salat and Zakat so long as I live. But to be good to my mother, I know I will outlive my mother. So I cannot say, I will be good to my mother so long as I live. It wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't make sense, because his mother is not going to be there when he comes back. SubhanAllah, from the day he was born, Allah had revealed to him that he will go and come back. <laughs> SubhanAllah. How Allah speaks in the Quran, man. Sometimes I study this stuff and I stop studying. I say, oh, there's too much in Allah. He's got to uh, take a break. <laughs> this is way too much. You know, I'm just going to go play some basketball or something, clear my head. But sometimes it's just overwhelming. Ya Rab, what kind of speech is this? How, you know, you, you know can you imagine if we were standing in front of the, the water when it was parting with Musa Ali Salaam? Like, whoa, what just happened? Water is just standing like this. And you're walking in the middle of it. Sometimes I feel like that when I'm reading Quran. And I want the Muslims to feel like that when they're reading Quran. I want them to feel every word. So they go, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's incredible. That's unbelievable. And it is believable. It's so believable, it's unbelievable. You know? That's what I want you to feel. That's what this weekend is about. It's just one big party. That's all I'm going to do. I've collected some notes over the years that I'll share with you. We won't get through all of them. I'll do whatever I can. I want to conclude this session by thanking all of you so, so very much for listening so attentively and carefully. SubhanAllah, you've been a wonderful, wonderful audience. Uh, as I leave you, one more thing about Fatiha came in my head. Might as well tell you because you're hot and tired anyway. So we asked Allah for guidance. And at the end of it, Allah put in the Mus'haf the next surah, which is what? Baqarah. And what's the first ayah of Baqarah? Oh, he said, Ya Allah, give me some good instructions. And Allah said, Alif Lam Mim. 
Oh, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that confusing? We just asked Allah for instructions, and the first instruction from Allah is what? Alif Lam Mim. Anybody know what that means? No. That is the biggest instruction. The first lesson, slave, is you don't know anything. That's the first lesson. If you learn this lesson, you'll be able to learn Quran. You don't know anything. You know? هُوَ الَّذِي أَخْرَجَكُمْ مِنْ بُطُونِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا لَا لَمْ تَعْلَمُوا شَيْئًا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا He is the one who brought you out of the belly of your mother. You still don't know anything. He didn't say you didn't know anything. He says, you still don't know anything. <laughs> you accept that, then you're ready to learn Quran. May Allah Azza wa make us wonderful students of the Qur'an. May Allah fill the barakah of Qur'an, give me your house and your family and your heart with the barakah of the Qur'an. I love all of you so, so very much. May Allah Azza wa protect you and preserve you. I made dua for myself and my team that is working so hard to deliver this service to you. And once again, please do me the favor, subscribe to Bayna.tv so the work can be of some benefit, inshaAllah ta'ala. I want to see a hundred million people, a billion people using this service and eventually I'll tell you my plans on Sunday. How I plan to make the Quran take over the world. And you're going to help me with it. InshaAllah. We'll talk about that on Sunday. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.